89 years. This was contrary to the law and the terms of the consent judgment. The consent judgment did not waive the requirement for payment of premium and ground rent on public land or the need for due process to be followed in extension from the initial grant of a lease of 10 years. Madam Speaker, for clarity, Ms. Janet Kobusinje was one of those who had been given titles in the Naguru Nakawa land. So in the what So in the consent judgment was availed to them land somewhere with a lease of 10 years. That was the consent judgment from court. But then eventually she was given a lease of 49 years. What that meant is she had to pay premium for the extra 39 years. She did not pay. And then the 49 years were now increased to 99 years. There was no premium paid. So we are saying the 89 years extra should have been paid for, but she did not, Madam Speaker. Just for clarification, the extension of from 10 to 49 to 99 was within how, what period of time? It was pretty much in the process of, you know, her getting to acquire possession, the leasehold possession. The interval of time. The interval of time. It was around the same time, Madam Speaker. Everything was done quickly. So she has got a lease of 99 years. But then the consent judgment was 10 years. So nothing stops her from acquiring whatever number of years. But then you have got to pay the extra 89 years. There was no evidence of that, Madam Speaker. Our recommendations, Madam Speaker. The committee recommends that the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development should ensure that the proceeds from the URC land at Nsambia of 69.5 billion should be prioritized and released to URC in the next financial year, 2022-2023 budget. Because the agreement was URC surrender this land to government because there are people who want to compensate. We Five billion. And to date, that money has not been paid. URC is struggling with many other challenges, paying staff and so on. And yet, government owes them money because of this land that was eventually given to several people. Number two, Madam Speaker, the Uganda Land Commission and the Privatization Unit should be held responsible for the anomalies that transpired in the allocation of URC land at Zambia. Because URC handed over its land and titles to Uganda Land Commission. So Uganda Land Commission is the one that dealt with the parceling out of these properties in conjunction with privatization unit. And so we are saying, Madam Speaker, things like this should not happen. And it's OK. It's not OK. Action should be taken. Then people will know that you have got to follow processes. You don't sell land and then get payment, keep it to yourself. You don't avail this, this payment, because this is not your individual money. It is taxpayers' money. issuance of illegal leases over land belonging to Uganda Railways Corporation, URC. Over time, district land boards in Kampala, Jinja, Mbale, Gulu, Nwoya, ETC, and the Uganda Land Commission have created illegal leases over URC land. Several requests by URC to these land boards to cancel the said illegal leases have been futile. This has made it difficult for URC to recover its land. URC has written to these bodies and the letters have not been responded to. Some of them have been added as parties to litigation cases involving URC. And there's a matrix uh, showing these details. Our recommendations, Madam Speaker. All illegal leases on URC land should be canceled by the issuing authorities because they're And the district land boards involved in issuing these illegal leases should be held responsible because what they are doing is illegal. So action has got to be taken against them, Madam Speaker. Number three, URC should come up with clear mechanisms on how to lease its land so that the appropriate value of the assets can be ascertained. When it's done in a haphazard manner, that's when everybody now will grab some land for them, the other will pay less for the value, etc., etc. Madam Speaker, the other issue that we interrogated was locomotive engines. 
The committee inquired from management about the inventory list of locomotive engines for the corporation, the status of operation, engine capacities, location, and whether they possess fuel registers. The committee was informed that URC maintained the fleet of all locomotives under its use, indicating the status of operation, et cetera, et cetera. Further, the corporation maintained the fuel register. On further scrutiny, however, the committee made the following findings. Four locomotives were purchased in August 2021 at a total of 48 billion shillings, but since they arrived, they had been packed in the workshop with no work. The URC workers interfaced with the committee at the time and revealed that the locomotives were imported without knowing that they were too long for the triangles and not able to turn. These are dynamics of railways. The workers of URC also stated to us in our committee that the technical staff were not consulted prior to the commencement of the procurement of these locomotives. Now, this was not a requirement, really, but they're saying, you know, it's, it's, it's just a good thing because the, the bosses take the decision. But it's just good manners to inquire from the juniors, quote unquote, uh, what do you think? Give us some advice because they're the end users. And so they thought maybe if they had been consulted, they would have been able to give some advice. Number two, the Uganda railway line of 50 to 80 pounds would not be able to handle the weight of the new locomotives, which required that it runs on a 90 pound railway. C, the motors which propel the locomotives are very low and that they were unoperational on Uganda rail lines. These are issues that we found. URC management responded that the corporation was making modifications to the triangles on the rail lines to enable the locomotives to move smoothly and that this would be completed by 15th November 2021. They were not able to hit that deadline because they acknowledged that they needed to make certain changes on the rails for these locomotives to operate with ease. So they gave us a deadline, they didn't hit it and so on. They further stated that the locomotives had been procured with additional spares for three years and the line was fit. However, the turning points were narrower. This was an admission by the management of Uganda Railways Corporation. The committee was informed that the locomotives would only serve Kampala Malaba and only the turning point would be modified. The committee made the following findings, Madam Speaker. After carrying out a market survey, a URC select committee recommended that the company purchases locomotives which are six years old at 36 billion. However, locomotives which were eight years old, costing 48 billion, were procured. This is problematic, Madam Speaker. A select committee put in place made contacts and so on, and the recommendation they gave was, look, uh, we have identified locomotives that are six years old, costing 36 billion. But the people who purchased, Madam Speaker, bought older locomotives and more expensively. It doesn't even make logical sense, Madam Speaker, because what is older should be cheaper. Uh, and, and this was their information, because they're the ones that put in place the select committee, which made all these recommendations after doing market research. Two, the committee notes that this was odd because older yet more expensive locomotives than those recommended were purchased. Management stated that of the 48 billion earmarked, 42 billion was for the locomotives, and 6 billion was for rich stakers. That's um, some technical equipment added to that. Our observations, Madam Speaker. The Ministry of Works and Transport deviated from the government policy of procuring new equipment and recommended and approved the purchase of used and refurbished locomotives because the approval came from the Ministry. Number two, the Procurement and Disposal Unit and the Contracts Committee of URC recommended open international bidding because of the amount of money involved. However, Management opted for restricted international bidding without proper justification. So again, the Procurement and Disposal Unit and the Contracts Committee of URC said, look, because of the money involved here, let's not get ourselves in trouble. 
let's do open international bidding. That's what is required. But then the people who actualized this decided, no, we shall deviate from what our committee has advised and we do restricted international bidding. So they went for a particular individual. They bought older, yet more expensive locomotives, Madam Speaker. Three, URC had to incur unplanned costs of modifications to improve the triangles and to provide turning points for these locomotives. Number four, the compatibility of the locomotive prior to procurement. So we, we are not saying these things, you know, um, cannot happen, but you see, it's important to cross every T and dot every I. Before you make a purchase of this magnitude, first do your homework. We don't think they did their homework. Our recommendations, Madam Speaker. One, the Ministry of Works and Transport should take responsibility for failure to follow the government policy on procurement of equipment. Number two, the management of Uganda Railways Corporation, which was involved in the procurement, should be held responsible for flouting procurement regulations and the unplanned costs incurred on modifications of railway. So you didn't do homework, you're costing the taxpayer money. Modify here, modify there, and so on. But two, you did not follow the procurement guidelines, which were even advised by your own internal committee. We feel that, Madam Speaker, these things should not be overlooked. People need to know that you've got to do the right thing, because it is taxpayers' money we are talking about. There are regulations that have got to be followed. The other issue we inquired into, Madam Speaker, was NSSF remittances. The committee learned that URC had not made remittances to, you, to NSSF for two years, and the workers were concerned that this would affect their interest, you know, which is meant to accrue to them. So the committee observed that over 2.8 billion shillings is still pending as NSSF areas, although pay had been cleared to date. URC prioritized and remitted pay without remitting the obligations of NSSF, and yet both are statutory obligations, and they're both equally important. Because you see, one way of motivating your staff members is not just a good salary, but NSSF, it is their money. When they retire, they should retire to this money. Our recommendations, Madam Speaker, number one, the committee recommends that URC management should prioritize remittance of NSSF since this directly affects individual employees who are missing out on an annual interest and on the outstanding NSSF remittance. And URC should ensure that the outstanding NSSF remittances should include interest, which should have been earned by the employees. Madam Speaker, when this money is not remitted, the workers lose interest for that year. So even when you eventually pay it, I don't know how many years, if they eventually pay it, it will be minus the interest to these workers. That's not fair to the workers of this country because they, they will have missed this interest for I don't know how many years. So even if you get that lump sum and you give it to them, it is minus a lot of money which they should have earned as interest. So we are saying that should be catered for. Remit that money, but with interest. Besides, these are your employees. When they are incentivized, they'll do a good job. One, you're paying them little money, uh, but two, it is minus, you know, a critical element that, like NSSF. So we feel that should be addressed, Madam Speaker. I'm on page, uh, somebody's asking which page? I'm on page 12. I'm getting to the conclusion. Our conclusion, Madam Speaker, URC management should oversee their assets better given that they have the potential to generate resources that would enable the smooth running of its operations and activities. The board of URC, as required by law, should pay keen interest in the affairs of URC and always provide appropriate guidance to management to enable the entity to effectively carry out its mandate. It's our prayer that the committee report be adopted. I beg to submit. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson of Kosase.
And as you've noticed, we are dealing with another government agency, which is rid of management, land issues, NSSF remittance. And of course, you know, it disadvantages the beneficiaries. Because if you're not remitting NSSF, then the interest will not be got by the beneficiaries from NSSF. And even when I used to be in Kosase with the Honorable Katuntu, URC has had all these problems. And from the time we presented our report, no treasury memorandum has come out. How I pray this time around it comes out because we need these things resolved. The report is here, ready for debate. Can we first hear from the minister, from the two ministers? Madam Speaker, I did appear before the Committee of Kusase and my position as the Minister of Privatization, this time not investment. And I do uh, agree with the recommendations of the committee. Uh, Madam Chair, particularly on the issue of uh, 69.52 billion that government has to pay as compensation for the Zambia land. I did commit to the committee when I appeared that uh, government undertakes to make good of that obligation. And I went back to the ministry and wrote a letter to the permanent secretary of finance and secretary to treasury on the 10th of February. Uh, requesting that the money 69.524400 billion is made available madam chair it is the understanding of ministry of finance that we have to make good of this obligation and therefore pay this money to urc due to competing get this money again uh, in the financial year but since we are in the process of budgeting the understanding of my ministry is that when we get more money through tax collection and other sources of resources we will be able to pay this particular amount of money we commit as government to pay the 69.52 I'd like to submit. Honorable Minister, what's wrong with you including that 69 point something in the next financial budget? The budget process is still ongoing. Or oh, oh, have you included it? Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, as the process is, my job as the minister of the minister is to write to the permanent secretary and to include this i did that on the 10th of february and the response was that we do because of competing priorities we're not able to get this money and therefore it was not uh, included in the budget but Ms. madam speaker if the wish of parliament is that we have to put it here since we're in the budget process uh, then we will put it as underfunded priority, and when resources are available, then we'll be able to make good of uh, the payment. If it's a legitimate claim, then why don't we budget for it? I mean, we're in the budgeting process. Yes. So include that in your budget. All right, Honorable Speaker. I have looked at the report presented by my very eloquent colleague. And indeed, the report is very comprehensive. And I have 
First of all, on the onset, I want to let this house know that the Uganda Railways Corporation is a very critical sector, very critical agency in the transport sector. And uh, I also want this house to know that indeed the URC suffered a lot of ills in the last so many years, and all those ills were managerial in nature. I want to request this house to allow me to go back to my two colleagues after the debate, and we prepare a very comprehensive resp response to this house, indicating all this, and particularly capturing areas where we have made interventions so that together as a ministry and this honorable house, you'll be able to appreciate how far we have moved. After appreciating how far we have moved, clarification, Madam Speaker. There is a procedure matter from Asman, Asman, then Medi. Speaker. So speaker, the minister has been on the floor and in her own words did the report as presented. The report now is before us. Where the other side concurs with the contents of the report. She was particular, even she said, I agree with the recommendations. Yes, she said she agrees with the recommendations. Was it, would it be procedurally right for the minister to say they are going back to present a response and yet they have already said they agree with the recommendations. Would it be procedurally correct? is a treasury memorandum. Who will adapt this report? And you will come with a treasury memorandum on what actions we were taking. And that is, that is final. You're not going to start revising this report and say you're coming back to, to, to give a response. We are going to give you six months to present a treasury memorandum here. Yes, maybe. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, this report is a report of Parliament. And every member here has a stake in this report. And in this case, we've not processed the entire report. My view, Right Honorable Speaker, and my humble prayer is let's exhaustively debate this report, adopt it whether with amendments or anything otherwise, then we can come up with recommendations that can bind the minister to present. But if we make a ruling, it will be putting the cart before the horse now. We are not putting any ruling. We have not stopped any debate. We wanted to hear from the two ministers who are responsible. Minister of Finance, who has accepted that the recommendations are okay. She even appeared before the committee. Now I wanted to hear from the Lines minister who is Minister of uh, Works, who is not sure. So we debate the report and adapt it or reject. Yes, Honorable uh, Baka. Uh, thanks very much, Madam Speaker. And I want to thank the Minister of Finance for accepting the recommendations. And when we are mentioning about ways on how we are going to look for the monies to be refunded to RC quickly, the issue of NSSF, which is mandatory, and where you know very well that we are in the process of giving mid-term, you do not indicate it. The workers were contributing that money. And you are still was keeping it. What are you saying about the monies that has already affected 
the, 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 the workers as we talk now, because they can't get the exact percentage of mid-term mid if that money is not funded quickly. Can I get the answer from the minister? Uh, honorable, honorable Buffer, there is a law to that effect. And the law will be useful if only that. Honorable Minister, are you finished? I think, Madam Speaker, given your guidance, let's go into let the members make enrich the report by debate, and then I will uh, absorb uh, some of uh, absorb some of the issues that the members on top of this. Then we shall see how to proceed. But I can assure you, I can assure you, Madam Speaker. I can assure you, Madam Speaker, that given the fact that we haven't studied it thoroughly as a, a sector, there is need for us to appreciate, first of all, the details before we give a comprehensive response. But I am ready for the debate. Honorable Minister, did you, did you interact with the Minister of Works? You did. I don't speak of the minister, the senior minister of works himself, General Katumba Amala, came to the committee. Okay. Thank you. Now we open it to a debate. Maybe. Uh, Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, I would like to thank the committee for the job they did. Right Honorable Speaker, I'll make reference to the following in enrichment of this report. The Committee on Purchase of Locomotives clearly states that in its findings, it discovered through research that the prices of, of the locomotives acquired were higher. I'm not here to disagree with them, but I'm only asking them to give us their reference for this research. To clearly state as to whether what they bought costed this and what is on the market is this according to this cross research that we have. That is one. Two, the instruction for cancellation of titles cannot come as a recommendation from Parliament. Why? Under the Registration of Titles Act, cancellation of titles, with a few exceptions, is the preserve of High Court. Can I go on, please? So the recommendation would be, in this case, that where it's found that there was fraud or there was any entry made erroneously, then this parliament can recommend that. And that is the law. That is the law. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Right, Honorable Speaker. With due respect to Honorable Sereko, who is not a member of the committee that investigated, and the committee came out with its own recommendations. And on several occasions, we have had reports here where a committee recommends cancellation of titles. Unless Honorable Bonsereko is telling us that he's an interested party in the land of uh, Uganda Railway Corporation, is in order, right, Honorable Speaker, for Honorable Bonsereko to begin putting in his own recommendation, watering the recommendation of the committee, which is in the interest of the committee, as you directed, right, Honorable? Honorable members, the committee is arguing the responsible institutions. We are not counseling as parliament. 
And it I, is saying the responsible institutions right. must take an action on it. Before I was rudely interrupted by the member, it is a recommendation of this August House. And if you're not recommending to a particular directorate to interest in itself in the cancellation, the powers belong to the High Court, and therefore it all remains redundant. Thirdly, as regards the funds, the funds were transferred by those that paid premium, the 69 billion. It's not compensation to finance. And finance should only tell this parliament where this money is. We are not talking about compensation, right, Honorable Speaker. Those that paid the premium after advertisement paid 69 billion in lieu of which these funds should have been given to Uganda Railways Corporation. The issue in question here is where are these funds from finance? It's not about compensation. And what were these funds used for? So I would not like us as a parliament to interest ourselves in a matter of compensation which is inexistent. It's misappropriation of this 69 billion. That should be the question. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. There is an aspect of money which was supposed to be paid for the land which is sold, purportedly being sold, and the money cannot be accounted for. It. They cannot know where the money was put. And then there is also money that was supposed to be for compensation from finance, which has not reached URC. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And I want to thank the, the chair for the great job. Uh, first of all, I really want to bring it to the attention of my, of my honorable in-law that I'm a little bit disappointed in a sense that you serve, you serve the same government or same So, so we have in-laws in this house, yeah? Honorable Minister <laughs> General, um, I'm a little bit disappointed this afternoon uh, by the fact that your colleagues from the same system, your work or your roles are supposed to reinforce one another. Uh, Madam Minister did indicate that she had no problem with the report. And I thought as a, a family in a government system, if you had a views to the contrary, I think that should not have been brought to the surface. I just wanted to make that crystal clear to uh, place before your attention my disappointment. Madam Speaker, corruption is bleeding this country, Uganda, to death. According to the 2021 IGG report and 2022 IGG interim report headed by an officer appointed by the president, this country loses up to 22 trillion shillings to corruption. 22 trillion shillings. And I'm quoting IGG report. Madam Speaker, from the 22 trillion Uganda shillings lost to corruption every year, one trillion is lost to procurement fraud alone. Here yes, we are. Two minutes, two minutes. Yes. Here we are, Madam Speaker. We have our teachers that cannot be paid. Health workers, we cannot pay them. We have hospitals that are not well equipped. I really want to thank uh, the committee and the leadership of the committee. 
Time is now, Madam Speaker, because we will be confronted with one question. What did you do? Any report that leads to money or brings to the surface or discovers corruption somewhere, I think it is up to, it, we have to answer the duty that this money that belongs to the taxpayers must be recovered. And I want to support the recommendations and then the money that are being pointed in the direction of corruption must be recovered, including those that are uh, responsible for the loss. I want to appreciate it, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I want to thank the committee for the report they have presented. And I will interest myself on a few issues. As far as the railway to this country is concerned, that is from the Kenyan border. And Madam Speaker, it is in our interest that this infrastructure operates to the best of our ability. But unfortunately, in the purchase of the locomotives, I am a procurement specialist myself. I think technical specifications were not observed. And uh, we need to really get the culprits who were involved in making these specifications uh, to tell us what they really came up with. Because you buy five locomotives, and these locomotives are not compatible to our uh, rail lines here. So it means there that we were not organized enough in our planning and going for what would help us solve the problems. Madam Speaker, as I said, I represent kilometer zero. Now, on the other side, the Kenyan side, we have got the standard gauge railway. But we have also got an improved railway from Naivasha up to the border. And Madam Speaker, the jam that is currently on the, the Kenyan side of Malaba, because of the so many containers that are delivered by the railway on the other side, has made us get uh, sleepless nights at the border because of congestion and the inability for our railway to evacuate the cargo that is coming from that side. And this is arising from the, 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 the wagon, I, I mean the, the locomotives, that, are, that should have been good enough for us to ensure that the movement is good. Madam Speaker. There is a process. Uh, and what Honorable Angora is saying, on top of non compatibility of the locomotives, there was also a wasteful expenditure. 36 versus the 48. What is the justification? Yes. I raise on a procedural matter. When we are talking about prices and falsification of prices and the Honorable talked and told this parliament that he's a specialist in procurement. When you bring facts on table, you have to give us that this comes from here compared to this, because you must compare two facts. You don't just come and speculate and say that uh, this was expensive. For us to understand as parliament, we must have Honorable a good comparison. So what I wanted to raise, Honorable the procedure matter was raised. There is a report of the select committee of URC that recommended that the, 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 the locomotive that was supposed to be bought was 36 billion, but they went and bought the one of 48. Why don't you read the report? Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. There is a motion this side. If you know your conflict, don't discuss this report. Motion. Yes, Madam Speaker. There is a motion. Madam Speaker, I beg to move a motion. Madam Speaker, I beg to move a motion that uh, the House adopts this report as it is, and we give six months for government 
to bring a treasury memorandum on this report and even all that are pending because URS is a very serious matter. I beg is to move. Is the motion seconded? The, mo the motion is seconded. Don't, don't, don't shout. This is not a market. Don't shout. Chair, I beg to move an amendment to three months. Yes, we are the amendment of three months that we receive a treasury memorandum. Is it seconded? It is by law. By law, by law is six months, not so. Let's not go against the law because of the agency. Maximum of six months. Yes, by law, it is maximum of six months. But we can even receive in one day. Yes. Thank you, Right Honourable Speaker. Allow me to thank the full job. Madam Speaker, these are the kind of reports that will define the 11th Parliament. And uh, the bipartisan approach to this report is very encouraging of this Parliament, Right Honourable Speaker. But I rose to amend the six-month moratorium, bearing in mind, right on the speaker, that there are other constitutional reports for which no trade memorandum was provided. As part of the requirement to comply, and aware that even over the last reports, no trade memorandum was provided, we ask, of course not with a menace, but as a way of admonishing those responsible for providing treasury memorandum, for not giving us prior treasury memoranda, to give us this in three months. Because initially, they were not compliant to the law, so they are not asking for us to comply with the six months because their hands are not clean. Having failed to be compliant a priori, the same round, they should give us not only the new one, but even the old one in three months, I don't speaker, so that we can really enforce compliance and respect to the law and the parliament. I beg to submit. Uh, government. Government. Ma Madam Speaker, if the law says at most six months, it means even three months, even four months can apply. And if this house in its wisdom thinks in three months we should come here, who are we to challenge the house? We shall Thank go up, we shall put our heads together, we are a system, we shall be back here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Honorable members, I now put a question that the report of Public Accounts Committee on Commission Statutory Authorities and in State Enterprises on Operation of Uganda Railways Corporation be adopted by this House, those in favor say aye, and the contrary nay. The eyes have it. We need a report in three months. Special memorandum. Next item. Item four, motion for adoption of the report of the Committee on Rules, Privileges and Discipline on proposed amendments to the Rules of Procedure of the Parliament of Uganda. Honorable members, since the beginning of the 11th Parliament, there have been referrals to the Committee of Rules, Privileges and Discipline on proposed amendments of Rules of Procedure. As we are aware, the rules are the living documents that ought to reflect 
the dynamic arena that the legislature is on. Honorable Chair, can you come and present? Members, as I told you, I want you to be mindful we have a bill that we must process today. Well, thank you very much, right front of our speaker. Uh, right, now, right front of our speaker, I beg to learn table, the original reports signed by the minimum number of members required together with the minutes of the committee. Beg play. Ms. Lee, thank you. Uh, right honorable speaker, on the 19th of October, 2021, before I present the report, this house amend particular aspects of the rules. Looking at the answer at both page 42 and 45, the presiding officer then the presiding officer then let it and I quote Thank you, Honor Members. What we are doing at the moment is identification. I see Honorable Cartoon is rising, but I don't know on which point he's raising. At this stage, we are doing identification of the problematic areas so that when we make reference to the committee on rules, privileges, and discipline, we give them guidance. Otherwise, we are not going to start from rule one to the last. It will not work. We know the problem areas, and so we are going to identify them so that by the time we make a formal reference to the committee, they will be properly He emphasizes that also on page 45, when he directs it. Let us do the identification properly and then we do a formal reference to the committee. I think now he's addressing me. I think you stay what you have done now. Let us add you more and then you build on it so that we have a you are comprehensive in what you are doing, you are going to do, chairman of the rules committee. So Right Honorable Chair, Right Honorable Speaker, a long time we've been waiting to have the guidance and identification of the problematic areas which this House has not done, and that has led to this committee not be presented in the 45 days, because literally there was a stay by the presiding officer or by the House. That also answers the leader of opposition's letter to me because he had asked what happened. Uh, I'm sure at that time he hadn't addressed himself to what the House had directed, that we stay reporting. Sorry? Okay. Uh, right Honorable Speaker. Thank you, uh, Honorable Katunfo. Right Honorable Speaker and Honorable Members of the House, I seek your indulgence to allow us an opportunity to defer this matter to tomorrow. I am only getting an opportunity to look at it now. And if my colleague would be pleased to allow us just to read it and come back tomorrow so we can proceed on it. I seek your indulgence, right, Honorable Speaker, honorable members of the House. Thank you, right, Honorable Speaker. Uh, of course, I have had occasion to look at the report of the committee. And uh, of course, I have uh, a bit of challenge with uh, the report. Not that I disagree with uh, the fundamental contents of the report, 
But we are aware, right on the speaker, that this committee does not work like other committees. It only works on uh, referrals of the House, and uh, it's rarely interactive to seek the input of uh, the ball. Uh, I do not know whether it would, uh, in a way, um, deter the House from doing work on time. Uh, and I want to a bit agree with the Land Attorney General that this report would stay to allow the opposition in the Parliament, with the indulgence of the Speaker, not to prepare, but to interact with the leadership of the committee on what we had considered as the import initially of my motion. Uh, and I want to be sure, because I never was given occasion to, uh, to really speak to it in the committee, I do not know whether they answered, I'm not trying to fault the answered in any way, but I want to be sure that was uh, properly, properly uh, recorded. And the import of what I've seen in the rules that we are on the same page with the, the land attorney general and the, uh, the chairperson of the committee who did a good job. The land chairperson at that, right on the speaker. <laughs> so that's this, these are our rules, right on the speaker. And they are speaking to the issues that are going to make our work smooth that the, we do not work acrimoniously. If you saw, uh, if it pleases you, right honorable speaker, that this report be stayed to allow an interaction of the opposition in parliament with the leadership of the committee, unless the chairperson has an objection clothed in the law, I would then hesitate to push it further. Uh, can, can, I, can, I, can I hear from the... the... The chairperson. Thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. Colleagues, these rules govern the way Parliament conducts its business. And if we don't address them comprehensively, logically, then the way we do our business may be affected. So if any colleague would want to have an input or a considered opinion, I would not have an objection. Why should we? Because this is supposed to help us to do our work. So to me, I don't have any problem. Uh, I also want to reply, uh, to give a reply to the leader of opposition. I, I, I know where it's coming from. Unfortunately, there was a problem with the handset. It didn't capture, I think, what it thought would capture. What it captured was the by-election, and that's what we handled. What, because we had a little bit of discussion with me yesterday, we are due to present this report, and I said that wasn't captured. But whatever it is, we are ready to review whatever this house directs us to do, because in the report, we also noting right on the speaker that there are really some aspects in our considered view which we think should be reviewed. For example, how does a house of 500 members conduct its business? Was that envisaged under our rules of procedure? Maybe not. So we have to think out of the box to see how we conduct business. So right. Uh, Sorry, I concede. Let the uh, my only problem is even tomorrow. I'm not so sure whether they'll be able to to comprehend and even look at the other aspects. So, if it may please the land, the the, the, the speaker, they might need a, a few more days other than two, other than one day. Uh, uh. Chair, thank you for considering, and I'm giving you two weeks to present uh, the report. Failure to reconcile by that time, you present as it is. Thank you. 
Two weeks is, uh, is okay with me, right when I was speaking. Yeah, I say that we Thank you very much. this group, then for us, we'll continue the report. Much obliged. Thank right you. Right when I was speaking. Thank you. Thank you. Next item. Item five, bills second reading, the electricity amendment bill 2022. Uh, honorable members, the electricity amendment bill 2022 was stable before this house for first reading on 27th January 2022, and was referred to the Committee of Natural Resources. The committee considered the bill, and the bill is now for second reading. Honorable Minister of Energy and Mineral Development. Honorable Minister. Can you move the motion, Honorable Minister? Titled, the bill entitled, the Electricity Amendment Bill 2022 for the second reading. Be read for the second Second time, I beg to move. Is the, is the motion seconded? Is it seconded? Seconded by Silwa Nyi, Attorney General, Honorable Musa, uh, the Prime Minister, Honorable Senu, uh, everybody else on the other side, Aisha, is that Aisha? <laughs> Honorable Aisha. <laughs> By charity, charity, congratulations for the promotion. Yes. Thank you. Honorable Minister of Energy, pardon? Would you like to speak to your motion? Right, Honorable Speaker. The object of the objects of the bill are the objects and principles of this bill are to amend the Electricity Act Cap 125 to provide for a staggered a staggered term of office for the members of the authority to provide for additional functions of the authority to increase funds allocated to the electricity regulatory authority from 0 0.3 to 0 0.3 to, to 0 0.7 percent of the revenue received from the generated electricity energy to empower the minister to prescribe the procedure to transfer uh, to transfer of generation assets to the government to prescribe the circumstances under which a holder of a generation license or a transmission license may supply electricity to persons other than a bulk supplier, to provide for the deterrent penalties for theft of electricity and vandalism of electricity facilities, to provide disputes tribunal and to provide for the related matters. The proposal to amend the Electricity Act Cap 145 is intended to remove inconsistencies in the law and introduce flexibility in its implementation and to streamline operations of the electricity sector. I wish to submit.
Uh, thank you, Right Honourable Speaker. Right Honourable Speaker, I wish to lay on table the minutes and the documents on the Electricity Amendment Bill 2022. Right Honourable Speaker, uh, as leaders, part of my work is to provi provide mentorship. And today, for that purpose, the Deputy Chair will be presenting the report, and I come in later to handle the amendments. Deputy Chair. <laughs> Right Honourable Speaker and the colleagues, mm -hmm. for the record, I'm Dr. Emily Kugonza, Member of Parliament for Vianja East County in the Kivara District, and also Deputy Chairperson Environment and Natural Resources Committee. Mm -hmm. Honourable Speaker, Right Honourable Speaker and Honourable Colleagues, I beg to present a report of the Committee on Environment and Natural Resources on the Electricity Amendment Bill 2022. The committee considered the bill in accordance with Rule 189C of the Rules of Procedure of Parliament. The Electricity Act Cap 145 was enacted in 1999, and there are new developments and changes in the electricity sector. The current law does not effectively address issues of institutional responsibility and adequate penalties for safety and electrical, electrical energy and vandalism of electrical facilities. It has therefore become necessary to amend the Electricity Act to fill the existing gaps and remove inconsistencies in the law, introduce flexibility in the implement, its implementation, and streamline the operations of the electricity sector. Yes, Dr. Uh, Mata. Madam Speaker, thank you for the opportunity. Madam Speaker, many of us have our iPads still being worked on, uploaded. Madam Speaker, in the past, they were displaying the report as a member present and uh, coupled with the fact that the doctor is so fast, is, would, would we be proceeding right if we continued in that way? Could, we, could it be possible that they display the report so that we, for those of us who do not have our iPad, we can follow? And the doctor to slow down, please. It's wrapping. But uh, I haven't realized that he's fast. He's not fast. Just deploy the, uh, just display the report. Continue. That's how he speaks, and that's why he's a doctor. Thank you, right honourable speaker. I, and uh, the report was uploaded, and uh, I believe, and I'm only giving just a synopsis, and uh, because I believe everybody has gone through at this particular time. Right Honourable Speaker and Honourable Colleagues, a comprehensive analysis, observations and recommendations to the bill are contained in the report. I will, however, make a brief remarks on some of the pertinent observations and recommendations made by the committee. One, funds of the authority. Clause five of the bill seeks to amend section 22 of the Principal Act by substituting the figure 0.3 with the figure 0.7 to increase funding to the authority and to provide for an additional funding to the authority. The committee noted that the authority currently has a funding gap of 8.3 billion. The committee further noted that in assessing the resource, need, the resource needs of the authority, the tariff, the tariff has been forecasted in line with the ongoing efforts to reduce the tariff for manufacturers who consume nearly 70% of the energy demand in the country 
to US dollars five cents per kilowatt, and energy sales are projected to increase by 11,203 kilowatts by 2024. And thus, a level of 0.7% of, of on generation revenue has been applied, and as such, the authority would be able to achieve financial sustainability in the long run and ultimately lower the tariffs for all consumers. The committee is in agreement with the proposed amendment and a more detailed analysis of this clause is contained under paragraph 6.3 of the report. Two, energy development fund. Right honorable speaker and honorable colleagues, the electricity supply industry has a significant deficit in transmission and distribution infrastructure. The committee observed that the transmission and distribution networks require an estimate of United States dollars 2.5 billion and United States dollars 1.5 billion in new investments respectively to repair and rehabilitate the network. This level of required financing is so high and would require additional loans to achieve, which is not sustainable for Uganda. This era creates the need to establish the electricity development fund with funding largely coming from monies appropriated by parliament, surpluses of the authority, and any other grants, donations, and gifts. The committee contends that creation of the fund will help to provide financing for electricity infrastructure like transmission and distribution of grid network infrastructure. This would boost uh, demand for electricity, leading to a further reduction in the distribution tariff and ultimately lays profitability of the sector, com uh, sector companies as they sell more units of electricity and increase the economies of scale. It is therefore this committee's recommendation that an energy development fund be created to paragraph 6.31 of the report for a more detailed analysis. Three is bulk supply. Right, Honorable Speaker and Honorable Colleagues, Clause 14 of the bill seeks to amend Section 56 of the Principal Act to remove monopoly the circumstances and may supply electricity in bulk to a hold of a distribution license or directly to a specified class or category of customers. The committee, among others, recommends that the supply of electricity to a specified class or category of customers be open to a more detailed analysis of this clause is contained under paragraph 6.4 of the report. Vandalism. Right, Honorable Speaker and Honorable Colleagues, the committee noted that clause 19.6 to amend Section 85 of the Principal Act by providing for deterrent penalties for vandalism of electrical facilities. The committee observed that UETCL spends on average over Uganda shillings 600 million per annum to repair vandalized towers on the existing lines across the country. Given the current rate of vandalism and the growing size of the transmission lines, these costs will increase unless the vice is contained. The committee is therefore in agreement with the proposed amendment to increase the penalty for interference with meters and electrical lines, vandalism, and illegal connections from 100,000 Uganda shillings or imprisonment of one year to 4 million Uganda shillings or a 10 year imprisonment or both for receiving vandalized electric facilities, repeat vandalism, and interference with electrical works. More information can be obtained from paragraph 6 and 6.7 6. 6. and 6.8 of the report. In conclusion, right honorable speaker and honorable colleagues, energy, especially, especially in form of electricity, is a major driver of social economic transformation of any country. For Uganda to transition from a peasant to an industrialized economy by 2040, there is a compelling need for increased electricity production to drive the economy. Vision 2040 aims at 80% grid coverage and electricity generation at 41,708 megawatts. However, for this target to be attained, the existing challenges in the electricity sector, such as high tariff rates, 
dilapidated distribution networks, and unreliable power supply to customers must be dealt with. The Electricity Act 1999 has been in existence for over 20 years. Therefore, its review is long overdue. The Electricity Amendment B 2021 is intended, among others, to address the high tariff rates, remove monopoly of the bulk supplier, prescribe circumstances under which a hold of a generation or transmission license may supply electricity to persons other than bulk supplier, render all renewable energy projects liable payment of royalties, curb safety and vandalism of electrical facilities in addition to strengthening the regulatory function of error by increasing its funding. There are With the proposed amendments, we will strengthen the legal, regulatory, and institution framework that is pertinent in improving the electricity sector. This is in the long run, will help Ugandans to maximize electricity benefits for social and economic transformation. I beg to report. Thank you so much, Honorable Chair of the Committee. You've had the report. And I now open the report for a debate. Yes, Jen, Milton. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, allow me to thank the Deputy Chair and the entire team of the Natural Resources Committee for this elaborate report. Right Honourable Speaker, I want to agree with the committee on the clause on vandalism. Right Honourable Speaker, why I want to agree is not just about the issue of uh, the risk at which our people are put into, Right Honourable Speaker. Right Honourable Speaker, However much we support and pass laws in this parliament, we must put at the back of our mind the enforcement bit of it. I want to pray that as we pass this bill today, right, Honorable Speaker, that the people we have entrusted with the responsibility to undertake the uh, enforcement must do their work, right, Honorable Speaker, if we are to save this country from repeated such acts, right, Honorable Speaker. Otherwise, I support the report. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nilton. Thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, I have to thank the report, the committee for the good report. And also emphasize the issue of increasing the penalty on people who've been vandalizing the network materials. Right Honorable Speaker, with the emergence of scrap dealers, the emergence of steel mills. So many people have been dealing in electricity equipment, vandalizing meters, vandalizing transformers and poles, dealing in them as scrap. So by us reviewing the penalty, I feel it's the way to go and it's so deterrent. So I have to agree with the amendment. And uh, if it were possible, instead of 4 million, we are talking over, we would even make it to five. It will be more deterrent. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the committee for the report. Uh, one of the issues raised is on the establishment of an energy development fund, which is a very welcome idea. However, we need to take ourselves back on the HIV AIDS fund, which was uh, established by an act of parliament more than five years ago. But to date, this has not yet been operationalized. So we need to ensure that we don't just establish it, but we have the Ministry of Finance making commitments to ensure that it is operationalized. Secondly, the penalty given from 100,000 to 4 million, I would like to seek clarity on it because at times the value of what has been vandalized is more than the 4 million shillings itself. And I thought, therefore, that we could put the, the 100,000 or the one, 4 million as a minimum, and instead you give a provision for an upper limit. Lastly, on the renewable energy projects, 
I need some clarification. It's indicated that they're going to be charged royalties. Is that going to have an impact on the renewable energy such as solar that is used? Because then if it's going to impact on the pricing, then that will become a big concern. I submit. Otherwise, I thank the committee and I support this amendment. Thank you very much, Right Honourable Speaker. Right Honourable Speaker, this country has a problem of respect to public property. Just for those of us who drive on the express, the Entebbe Express, UNRWA try to have uh, a chain link along that road. It has all been vandalized, the entire stretch. And if you don't drive properly, a cow might just come up there and cross the road and you can imagine what will happen. The public does not respect public property. The area will come up with very, very strong measures. Four million shillings is on the minimum. We need to be deterrent now. I would really think uh, Hono Moma is making a point that four million which the, 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 the minister and the committee are proposing is on the lower side. Especially when the property being vandalized is even more expensive than the four million shillings. So, and what do they do with this? They just get the very expensive materials of property and go and make some, look at what goes on with the solar along the highways. They have been vandalizing the batteries. So I think it is the time, first of all, to standardize anybody who is vandalizing public property, to, tell, to send a clear message to whether it is the uh, UMEME, whether it is KCCA, whether it is UNRWA, whether it is the whichever. No, no, no vagabond should vandalize our property, which we have spent a lot of money to put up. So I would propose at the right time, uh, uh, right time, Honorable Speaker, that the amendment, we should move an amendment to increase from 4 million to a minimum, a minimum of 5 million. That's what it should be, a minimum of 5 million. But at the committee stage, you shall be moving. Uh, last, right, Honorable Speaker, about funds. I don't see the Minister of Finance. You, you see, it's, it's no use creating funds we, and there are no funds. We had the same problem with even uh, the land fund. How much have we been putting there annual and so on? Very little money. We also have the same problem of management of those funds. You had the petroleum fund. And sometimes when we are having problems, we sneak into that fund and use money for other purposes other than the intended one. So we need an assurance that if we are creating a fund and it's for energy, it should be any public officer who uses that money for any other reason should be held responsible. We need to put it in the law so that these public officers don't misuse that fund. We are here enacting funds for a particular purpose. Why should a public officer divert that money and it is used for a particular purpose? I thank you, right on our speak. Thank you. Who is the minister? Prime Minister. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Honorable members, we are falling into a trap of legislating, making laws to create a situation where we are raising fines and fail to appreciate the situation on the ground. The matter to do with uh, vandalization of uh, Umeme. Uh, equipment and any other public uh, property has to do with uh, our failure to address the issues of the users. For example, we are involved in uh, a line 
to do with power. And out of, uh, it's about 4.6 4, 4. kilometers. We're only having uh, only four users. Why? Because the people cannot afford it. So they have no reason to protect your property. If you are talking about the chain link uh, on public roads, there is no provision for the poor people to access uh, e e e e their homes. So if it is vandalized, actually for them they are happy because you are, they are not really benefiting. So we should really look out for a way of involving the communities in matters to do with issues to do with public uh, services so that they feel part and parcel. If the entire village, you only have two people who can access and afford power, I have no reason to, to protect your, your power line. So wh whether you create fines, you will not have the capacity even to arrest the culprits. Or her and defend public property. So it is now a uh, uh, it's our responsibility as representatives of the people, not just create sort of a, a, a class society. Let us try to involve and let people benefit from public property for them to protect uh, public properties. I think that is, that is what is lucky. Otherwise, I support uh, the amendment and the law, but with that kind of consideration as policy makers. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. I stand to support this bill for the reasons that they are seeking to remove the monopoly that. No. Right Honorable Speaker, any form of monopoly is not healthy for this country. And as I wait to reject the coffee agreement tomorrow, allow me to upload the the committee for a job well done. Thank you. Uh, uh, Shadow, you will come last. Uh, thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Allow me to thank the committee for the great work you have done on this bill. Uh, I want to discuss on the issue of uh, increasing funding to the regulator. And I want to appreciate the committee for having realized that the regulator has had a big challenge. The regulator has been and is an arms chair regulator sitting in Kampala to regulate the entire country. And most of the times, there have been a lot of challenges coming from the consumers, especially on the issues of power outreach. And the response rate has been very low and attributed to low funding of the regulator. So I am very appreciative of the fact that this has been noted by the committee and they have recommended the funding at least to increase from the 0 0.3 to 0 0.7 percent. But my question to the committee still is, with the, with the funding gap of over 8 billion, I would love to know whether the increment from the 0.3% to 0.7% is able to, 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 to gap up the difference. Otherwise, thank you so much. I appreciate the committee's work. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Salah. Uh, right, Honorable Speaker, I thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about this bill. I'm Geoffrey Kayemba Solo from Bokomans in the South, and I'm going to, to speak as a layman from Chiriamemvu. My question is, why does the government, uh, why do people pay connection fee? Yet the government gets money out of your car they use. And most people give out their land for free 
to put in poles. But during time of connection, they want money for them to be connected. So I think my proposal would be the connection would be free so that the government can get more, more taxes out of the Yaka people use and even this and even this uh, unused is used. I beg to submit. And indeed, you have talked as a lay person. Yes. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Namanya Nabos again is my name for record purposes. Madam Speaker, I support the B. In my constituency, Madam Speaker, in Rubabo particular, it has become a habit for the public to come and vandalize electricity. Of recent, CUs came and vandalized the, uh, the electricity lines, and when it was valued, it was over 84 million Uganda shillings. So, Madam Speaker, I think it is prudent that we put heavy punishment to vandalism of electricity. Madam Speaker, a, co a transformer of power is far much higher than the 4 million which is proposed here. I would propose that the, the punishment should be equivalent to the value of what has been vandalized, Madam Speaker, so that the public can start respecting public facilities. I thank you, Madam Speaker. And members, you're supporting the, the report now, not the bill. Yes, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. I raise support the report. Madam Speaker, they have, they have proposed to bring down the tariff of those in industry to five cents per unit, which is a welcome direction. But the people of Uganda, the ordinary people, they don't have electricity, yet this nation have constantly listened from the president, telling us that we have surplus electricity in Uganda. Madam Speaker, last week I lost in my constituents a lady, an old lady, that was attempting to remove a wire from the pole of electricity because she was tapping in the morning. The wires pass everywhere, the connections, our oh, people don't have electricity. And one of the reasons why they don't have electricity is because the tariffs for home consumption are so high. Well, I welcome the idea, the amendment that uh, we, sh we should reduce the tariffs to the, for the industrial people. I'm looking forward to a day when this parliament will be given us an opportunity that we make suggestions. The doctor, that is provided for in the clauses, in the amendments. It's provided yeah. for. You'll so, get it. Yeah. Uh, thank you, yes. most obliged, Madam. Speaker. you have information? Yes, Madam Speaker. Uh, with all due respect given to your uh, uh, capacity, my colleagues, I don't know sometimes how things turn upside down. In Busia, Uganda, we have a village called Sophia. Village called Sophia, almost seventy percent don't have electricity. Because electricity in Kenya, which they import from Uganda, is cheaper in terms of tariff than the indigenous Ugandans they are using. That's what I'm saying. To Therefore, that's the information the I wanted to give to my colleague. Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. And the Shadow Attorney General. Yes, uh, and I know my younger brother, Orzo now senior. Appreciate, and I want to congratulate you, Madam Speaker, because this is my maiden speech hey. upon your ascension to the highest office. Thank you. Uh, having
I want, of course, to approach the committee, especially when they went into suggesting an energy development fund. Because our biggest challenges in the electricity sector are largely two, the efficiency and the security. I come from a constituency which has two power stations. Of course, one of the power stations became obsolete and it has never been repaired. It was built by the colonials called Mazabagoji Power Station. The last one that we have has been constructed by a private company, the Sri Lankan. But the biggest challenge I have is that my constituency is the least served in the terms of electricity penetration. We only see wires evacuating power to the national grid and we don't get it. Kisoro district, which is part of Kigezi, gets its power from Rwanda. When the president of Rwanda gets annoyed with Uganda, Kisoro remains in the darkness. Cover where I come from with the power station that generates six megawatts, cover indeed because of lack of industries, uses less than five uh, megawatts. But it has power fluctuations on a daily basis. Oh, I will give you. Uh, right honorable speaker, I want to give my colleague information. In my constituency, in 2011, government constructed uh, a mini power station in Buseruka sub county on River Wambavia. But the community around in that, sub, in that sub county have never benefited. And that's why people vandalize because they don't see any benefit. I thank you. So, so for members who seem to be looking at this row from the penal section, I beg that you look at the wider problem. How do we ensure that our people access electricity before you talk of penalizing them? So we need, we had the rural electrification agency. I am one of the happiest people that was disbanded because it was only catering for the interests of those who would approach the officials known. Can we have a deliberate move to extend electricity to all areas of Uganda and then reduce the tariffs and then talk about penalizing those who vandalize what we have delivered. But if my people remain in the darkness, people now start digging and using and slitting the dams because they don't see the benefits. We are talking of environmental protection. To, or to minimize the uh, use of wood for electricity and the like. Unless we really look at extending this power, which you now claim you overproduce, but it's not anywhere. And even those areas served have power fluctuations. We will make these roads that will not benefit the common man. I beg you. Uh, uh, Honorable Nwagaba, the access of electricity, the presumption is there is electricity in most places, though not fully there. But then the, we are making these laws for us to penalize people who misuse electricity in where it is. Just imagine where they are saying somebody just went and got it's tapping, illegal connection. We should have a law that regulates that. The other thing that we will discuss is how do we have electricity in each and every village at lower tariffs? That's what now we shall talk about. Because this law even talks about the tariffs, the reduction of tariffs for the local people. It talks about it. When you go to the closest, you'll find it. The upper line. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Uh, thank you very much, the Right Honorable Speaker. I would also like to thank the committee for the recommendable work. Again, I want to seek clarity on the issue of paying royalties. Honorable Speaker, the committee has recommended on clause 15, where they are saying that renewable energy... Let's, they are going let's not go to committee stage. First, discuss the report. Okay, Honorable Speaker. 
Annette. Thank you, right honorable speaker. And I want to congratulate you in that seat because I've not been here before. Um, I want to support or second the report that was put forward, forward. But then from beyond the district, I want to take an example of Vukung landing site where the prime minister even happened to visit where 2.5 billion where it was injected in a nice plant and people came and vandalized the, the, the generators that were set up. Was that really due to lack of power or it was just out of moral decadence? I want to agree with the committee that the report that was written to penalize, let it continue and perhaps the penalty should be unequivalent to how much what has been vandalized costs. And then two, in Bukungu, we had the two, one gentleman who came up. Honorable on, members, I don't want to discuss about constituencies. Let's move. Right, on. Honorable. Allow me. It is not in general terms, what we should do, how we should amend the law to protect the users, to reduce the cost of the tariffs, and then to protect those people who like cutting wires and right on, let me pass it clearly. I'm also glad, but allow me pass this. I also humbly appeal that perhaps we should also increase the funds of the legal aids because this one gentleman came up on behalf of the government and he was not supported because he was dealing with it as an individual and the cutters of the government. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity. I want to thank the committee for the good work they have done. And specifically, I want to support their recommendations <clears throat> on uh, page 18 on VAT rate for domestic consumers. They made very pertinent observations. One of their observations was that uh, URA stands okay. URA made more corrections when the rate of VAT was uh, brought down from 18 to 10 percent by because they made power affordable. Number two, they also made an observation that they noted that the policy, when combined with other sector efficiency measures, it would clear, meaning that affordable electricity would clear the dimmed power in the system further saving hundreds of billions. Madam Speaker, those observations bring us to one question, one question how, which is the same question you've been asking. How can we make electricity cheaper? Already we have been notified that bringing down the VAT rate made electricity cheaper and affordable and more, more revenue was corrected. Madam Speaker, I stand to ask, how about this parliament during this budget uh, process? We allocate funds towards the electricity connection policy because apparently the funds that were there in the last financial year were depleted. And since then, the, the project has been stalled. I will give you an example that in the rural areas, where well, the rural education agency extended power lines, there has been failure to connect these lines to the end user. And actually, that has brought vandalism. Myself, they vandalized two electricity lines because for almost one year, we've had these lines installed, trans, uh, uh, transformers installed, but because the, ex the connection uh, fees of two point something and 700 are expensive for the end user, there has been no connection. Therefore, I, I stand to support the observations, I mean the recommendations that uh, the, the recommendations on VAT, support the recommendations on VAT, that VAT act be lowered to 18, from 18 to 10% on domestic consumers. I also highly recommend, and, and I mean, I support the recommendation that VAT be zero rated for the cost of new connections. But I also ask Parliament and the budget team 
that we find funds in this budget to deal with those power lines that have been extended, but there's no connection that is ongoing, so that we can have the connections made and possibly recover from the revenues that we will get from uh, the electricity that we sell to these consumers. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to thank the committee for the good report. However, Madam Right Honorable Speaker, a lot has been said about vandalism of transformers and others. I'm looking at it from a, a different angle. As a scientist and more so a doctor and a professional, we, are, we look at prevention as a better thing than cure. When you look at the way the engineers do their work, there is one aspect that is normally left out, and that is prevention. In our rural setting, most people need electricity, and I agree with whoever is supporting that idea. But the question is, how can we prevent the criminals from vandalizing things like transformers? In my opinion, other than pushing for a penalty, extra mile, and see to it that those transformers that are put there are well protected, because as we look at them today, it is very easy. That is my opinion, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Huh? Yeah. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker and Honorable Colleagues. I rise to thank the committee chair and the entire committee for a work well done. I support the report and the bill from three perspectives. First is the provision of financing for the regulatory authorities. Sufficient resources for the regulatory authority will help them be able to do their work well. And we really pray that once these resources are made available, they'll be able to do a good regulatory work. Second is in the breaking of monopoly of generation and supply of power. A case in point for West Nile is when a record that because this is the only supply of power has made the people of West Nile be in recurrent out power outages. We pray that with the package of monopoly, we'll be able to see to it that more suppliers, producers of power will be able to improve access to electricity for the common man and women. Lastly, is in the area of theft and vandalism. Whereas on the one hand, I do support the penalties of the citizens vandalizing their own assets. So that by understanding the root causes of vandalism, apart from penalties, we will also be looking at the public education for them to protect these valuable assets. I thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Honorable, right, Honorable Speaker. For the record, Papa says, uh, my name is Anthony Esenu. I want to go on record to Members, thank the committee. Let's limit the debate. Let's use two minutes. I want to we thank. We still have a long way. Thank you. I want to just to comment on one aspect in the area of the tariffs that we have proposed. I think it's a good idea. But I'm concerned I need clarity on the two aspects, on biomass projects and the solar projects. If these are for commercial uh, based projects, I would have no problem with that. But if they are going to 
um, address projects which are generating power for own use in people's homes or pro, uh, premises, I would beg that that be given an exception so that we can encourage as many people as possible to get their own power supplies and avoid being charged an extra fee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. For the record, I'm uh, Isaac Ismail Otim Gyu from Padiere County, Nebi District. Madam Speaker, I support uh, what has been uh, laid on the table today, presented. On the issue of uh, vandalism, we, I wanted to bring out an issue on why some people resort to vandalism. Madam Speaker, up to date, we have got a number of people who have not yet been compensated on their land where these transmission towers and also those poles have stood. Despite various uh, applications to the Minister of Energy, this issue has not been attended to. In my constituency alone, I've also put a lot of those issues, but we do not support it and I condemn it, the issue of vandalism. But I think we need to be able to pay these people because usually when transmission lines are running, the money has already been allocated. I do not see the reason as to why we have to delay compensating some of these people. And lastly, on the issue of uh, the monopoly, I do support this very much because it is the main reason why the electricity is very expensive. If you look at the issue of Omeme, if Omeme is receiving electricity at 288 shillings and selling it at 974 shillings to the consumers, that is a very big margin. I know they will try and bring up the issue of uh, deemed energy and energy losses, also incurring losses which are being covered, but this is still a very big margin. And I support that more companies should come in and try and regulate so that the prices reach our consumers at a less price. I submit. Thank you very much, Madam. Thank, Thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. Poli Kapogwari from Magule, Palisa County. Thank you very much, uh, the committee, for the report. And uh, I do support as well. One, the penalty. The penalty being given, it's okay, even if it becomes 10 million. But, honorable members, and I, Honorable Speaker, I am not talking in a professional way because that's my field. There are two ways of stealing or vandalizing electrical equipment or materials. One, the old a cable that's lying when electricity is not on. I can give you an example, right, Honorable Speaker. In my constituency, 20, 20, 2015, they finished installing electricity. 2017, three transformers blew off. We have 12 poles down with the cables that we're trying to protect. Imagine it's almost five years those cables are lying down there. Are you going to blame people who are, who are going to sell for scrap? They are poor. Two, a professional person. These people of Umembe staff and Umembe contractors do still these cables direct because they know where the a, a, a switch is, remove the, the, the circuit breaker, go and steal, and then take the things. So at the end of the day, I support the penalty to be increased. Three, number two, I will have error. It is the one that is the authority that issues the certificates for the installation, both individuals and companies. But you find that there are next. The right honorable speaker, for the record, um, Tembo Gideon Mujungu representing the people of Songora South. Right, Honorable Speaker, I speak from experience of over 10 years having been the management of utility companies in the distribution sector. But I rise on the issue of the cost of electricity to the, co the final consumer. The cost of electricity 
takes three components. The cost of generation, the cost of distribution, and transmission. That adds up to what the final consumer finally pays. Honorable right speaker, right honorable speaker, I have a view that the cost of transmission could be subsidized or borne by government because Uganda Electricity Transmission Company is 100% owned by government. So, in a way, when government charges the transmission cost, it is charging the taxpayer, the final consumer. In my view, I recommend that we, re we consider subsidizing the transmission cost so that the cost borne by the final consumer can reduce and consequently the tariff chargeable to the final consumer will come down. I submit. Thank you. At the end of the day, we are going to have one single tariff because all those electricity bodies will be merged. Sarah, Stephen. Thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. What? I want clarification, Right Honorable Speaker. The tenure of office in the report is five years renewable. And yet, I thought that we had since adopted three years, and most of the bills that have been coming to this house have been three years renewable. Secondly, right, Honorable Speaker, we all do appreciate that we need electricity in the rural areas. We had the electricity. Uh, rural electricity levy. Unfortunately, right honorable speaker, rare has since been um, removed. It's no longer what it was and has since been mainstreamed into the ministry. By having this electricity development fund, because the other electricity levy was helping us, much as the money was going into the consolidated fund, but part of the reason why rare existed was to ensure that it has um, it uh, extended the electricity to the rural areas to reduce on the rural urban so for the various businesses. So this electricity development fund once created, I hope it will also be ring fenced for purposes of equally extending electricity to the rural areas, not just for infrastructure, as I've seen it stated right on our speaker in the report. It is, what is there is that it is for, for infrastructure, but we want to ensure that it is also, it does the same work as the electricity levy initially. I request to conclude right on our speaker. Right Honourable Speaker, the issue of vandalism has been talked about. But this, Right Honourable Speaker, is a serious matter. There is no way an ordinary person can go to vandalize a transformer. These are people who are knowledgeable, they are educated, they have been working with this system, and therefore they know how to remove that transformer oil from these transformers. The penalty must be deterrent to discourage anybody from venturing into that. Short of that, right, honorable speaker, we shall pass the law here and the vandalism will continue. Right, honorable speaker, the issue of rare has to also be discussed. We all know the bureaucracies in rare, government rare, systems. Rare is not part of the bill. Right, honorable speaker, it is in the report. It's talked about. That's, and I'm discussing the report. So, right, honorable speaker, we need that report on the, the committee, the select committee on the mergers. I don't know when it is coming, but you all know, colleagues, that the 
in the way that it was operating before. So we need to also have that. We shall not have electricity extended when rare is in mainstream in the ministry, right, Honorable Speaker. Thank you very much. I want you to appreciate by the time we constituted a committee Rare had already gone. Rare was no longer rare, it was part of a, part of the mainstream. And truth be told, we really imagine these people who do the installation are the same people who go back and steal. They are the same people who go back and steal. So we must have a very high penalty for these people. And as somebody said, You just don't leave a transformer bare. Put it in a bush and you leave it bare. And there should be a protection for that. Stephen, Balmoy, Bish, Commissioner. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, in the interest of time, I will just tie myself on the issue of vandalism. Right Honorable Speaker. I am going to send away one member of parliament out. Right Honorable Speaker. He has gone. Right Honorable Speaker, a transformer, the cost unit of a transformer is above 20 million. Yes. So for us to say that once someone is guilty, maybe he was found stealing a transformer, must pay five millions and above. This is a great business, right on our speaker. These people are installing these transformers, they know how to tie them and how to remove them. It is quite hard for a, a commoner to go in the village down there and remove a transformer, it is quite hard for them. Right on our speaker, protection is better than chua. Rather, prevention is better than chua. We have been seeing how people can be in position to monitor who has tampered with either transformer or something else, we need to have a control unit here at the center. Once a transformer is tampered with in the village there, let these people in the control unit tell that so and so has tampered without transformer. So he can be in position to go and follow up and get that person and we can at least give a real penalty. Let, have, let us have a control unit here in the center we put a gadget in those transformers, we put a gadget in, on those wires. The moment those systems are being tapped, to finish. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity. My name is Lake Sharon Balmoy. I am the woman member of parliament for Gulu District. I want to thank the committee for the report. It was a well elaborate one. Uh, Madam Speaker, I think in this country we, we learn nothing and forget nothing. Why am I saying this? For time immemorial, the electricity poles have been falling down. They put small poles, weak poles, thin poles for that matter. They fall down. Once the rains come, they are, they are gone. Uh, the bushmen, or when they're clearing the, the bushes, they burn, the bulbs burn. Some of them burnt them deliberately simply because they say the rich have power, we don't have power. Yet the lines are moving in our gardens. Uh, Madam Speaker, I, I see a lot of money being put on these poles year in and year out. Why can the government think of putting concrete poles? I have seen a few in some places, but most places don't have concrete poles. Why don't we get a lasting solution to this? Instead of buying poles year in, year out, and this money could go to very important priorities such as health, agriculture, among others. So uh, this is one of my recommendations. Secondly, um, we have what they call rural electrification. You cannot tell me a layman or a peasant in my district, say Gulu district for that matter, cannot afford to pay or buy a, a pole of two, two million shillings to install power in a one-room house. I would really suggest that the power tariffs be subsidized, especially for the different 
uh, I mean, uh, fee to be paid, which is affordable by the, the local person back in the grassroots, so that our people get power. In Gulu district, as I conclude, Madam Speaker, in Gulu district, 90% of my people don't have electricity in their homes. And then poles are running in the compounds, on the fields. It really, it's, 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 not a, it's not very balanced. And I think we should, uh, you know, work on this. I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Right Honourable Speaker. I would like to take this opportunity also to congratulate you. Uh, because this is my first time to talk after you assumed uh, that powerful seat. Uh, right Honourable Speaker, I would like to thank uh, the committee for the good work uh, they have done, especially on this bill. But I would like to bring to attention uh, the members of Parliament a few issues. Number one, is that I think and I believe there is a poor planning in terms of uh, utility companies and the government in terms of uh, 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 in terms of uh, installation because most of the time you find that because of poor planning between utility companies you find uh, electricity poles are uh, placed in the areas where maybe the water is going to pass uh, from and as such when the water uh, companies when the water, maybe national water is trying to construct uh, their uh, infrastructure they tamper with the uh, with uh, electricity poles so i think we need uh, proper planning in this country for us to ensure that everything moves in the tandem. Uh, second, right honorable speaker, uh, these days, especially in other countries, you find that they have what you call uh, concrete poles as opposed to wooden poles. In Uganda, we are still using wooden poles and they rot very fast. For example, in my constituency, no. Silani, then I have a leader of opposition. Thank you. Right Honourable Speaker, I want to thank you and to add my voice, especially in the area, Right Honourable Speaker, where the electricity companies, especially RARE, when they are installing electricity or when power gets a challenge, they take a very long time to repair. I have a place that I want to use as an example, right on the speaker. There is a landing levels came up, right on the speaker, and this is in Bujiri district, Bolida, sub county. When the water level electricity poles were consumed. But when these electricity poles were consumed, the electricity body ignored and left this place abandoned, not cared for, for a period of over three years. Right on the speaker, in such a situation, do people now think that I take the information. It is very important, right, Mr. Speaker. Allow me to take the information. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Colleague, for giving way. I join you in criticizing the report in regard to what you're saying. Okay, in regard to what you're saying. Well, relatedly, bulk supply has been looked at at the, at the side of the providers. It was restricted, you've opened it up. But you're not looking at it on the side of the customers. What they are doing, they are going into small markets, bulking up all the traders in the market on one meter, one with a fridge, one without a fridge, then they come while paying the bill. The same is also happening with meters. They are bulking them up. But overall, can we have a discussion 
or nationalizing electricity because it's a, a vital service, just like water is. We should not accommodate private players in electricity, else the cost is going to go up. Let this be the first parliament to discuss the nationalization of electricity as the case was then. Honorable member, yeah, for right. honorable member, let's not justify the reason for vandalizing. It is illegal. Whether the uh, polls passed in your garden and not correct an illegality with illegality. That should not happen. And now we are talking about the cost of connecting from pole to pole, then pole to house, the real electrification. I have heard you talk about two, two, two million something. Real electrification, the connection is 19,000. Uh, the minister will, will make a clarification on that. Le members, we are running out of time. Please. Uh -uh, Commissioner, you gave out your time. Can I now hear from the leader of opposition? But you're giving. Okay. Uh, thank you, right honorable speaker. I'll be very brief, but let me commence with uh, an appreciation to you and the deputy speaker and all the members who stood with me uh, in paying the last respects to my father last week. Madam Speaker, what is of concern in this report is something on uh, UEB, Uganda Electricity Board which was unbundled 22 years ago, actually 23 years. That is in 1999. It is still undergoing liquidation. When is the minister completing this liquidation? And the... I have not accessed all these assets. Where are the whereabouts of those assets? Another important issue in this report is about the vice of vandalism, which I must say the report is put on not to leave it go unpunished. It should receive the highest punishment so that it is a deterrent to the Umeme technical staff who are the ones championing this vice. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Right Honourable Speaker. I want to appreciate the committee for the report and the generally for accepting to absorb and accommodate so many cross crisscrossing issues. I appeared before this committee and made an official position of the opposition on these amendments. And uh, I'm happy to report that uh, there was a good debate and uh, many of them generated a number of uh, emerging issues I have seen in the report. So I want to thank Dr. and his team for uh, being receptive. Uh, right on the speaker, I want to begin with uh, the issue that, uh, that, that generates favor in the, uh, so many uh, people's mind, which is vandalism. Already on our criminal books, criminal books, uh, uh, there are penalties to those who do the final drafting, or even before to look at what those laws say and the attendant penalties to avoid uh, uh, making this uh, a penal to enact a penal section that has uh, a bigger penalty than those in the other uh, legislation passed by this house that would not have a conflict of laws. Probably you consult with the people who draft the final titbits. I've not looked at them, but you need to to avoid uh, the conflict of laws. Two, right on the speaker, 
essentially the, the, the bill was on strengthening uh, the regulatory function of the, the industry. But I'm glad that the report is accommodating the emerging issues that were not addressed in the bill. And I thought when I addressed the committee that we are missing an opportunity to really do a decent job in addressing key gaps in the sector. Um, and I think this report in a way tries to do that. I want to thank the committee for that observation. Um, and of course, the idea of establishing the, the Electricity Development Fund. There were concerns that uh, the funds created in other agencies were not working and they didn't have money. But part of the reason was that these funds were created without necessarily real run these funds. But for this particular bill and the law that will come out, we are very particular. And I want to invite the House to support that amendment of creating uh, the Electricity Development Fund because the, the UEB successor companies are profitable and they normally have surplus revenues. These surplus revenues, they invest at the stock exchange, they buy treasury bills and so on. But while we are borrowing money to finance infrastructure, yet we have money that we are investing in treasury bills and bonds in billions of dollars speaker. And yet we come here and borrow for the same purpose. So I think we are taking care of this void in part, yes? But also, we shall be able to reduce the, uh, the borrowing to finance uh, maintenance of infrastructure and expanding uh, electricity. Let us speak, uh, thirdly, the um, observation subsequent appreciation of the need to reduce uh, the VAT on the final consumer is appreciated. And this time around, the right on the speaker, the domestic consumers constitute about 29% of uh, the overall. The, the rest are other consumers. But part of the constraint to their enrollment on the grid is the cost, which members have ably discussed. By reducing VAT, because the VAT Act allows for zero rating, it allows for exemption, and we expect in the, now that the Minister of Finance is here, in the tax bills that we are considering under this appropriation uh, uh, undertaking we are making, take care of this VAT valuation, at least for domestic consumers from 18 to 10. It's, I can assure you there will be no less loss visited on the agents because it will facilitate enhancement of enrollment and more revenue will be generated than from the VAT. By getting more people on the grid, you'll be able to collect more revenue. Uh, right on the speaker. Right on the speaker, and uh, one of the things that I appreciate from the report, initially, the bill had proposed to list the Umeme successor, com the UEB successor companies for share sale. Let us speak, these are the very few profit-making government entities that people were prepared to partake of. The rejection of this overture, right on the speaker, is appreciated. This retained some government companies that are profitable to be retained by the government. To scavenge on them should be stopped, and I appreciate the report for that observation. Lastly, right on the speaker, we initially part of what informed the uh, the gist of the bill was to reduce uh, the bills for industrial consumers, especially uh, from gazetted industrial parks, which the president had promised to be at five past, five U.S. cents, and the rest of the consumers were not catered for. And the report by coming out for equity for all industrialists is acceptable. That should be the case. Industries are not a preserve of industrial parks. They are everywhere, 
and therefore we must promote that fairness as proposed by the report right on the speaker i want to thank the committee and uh, the rest of the members and i want to support the report and i wait for the close by close consideration thank you I thank you thank you Lo. and the beauty between the uh, behind this money that is being increased from 0 0.3 to 7 is to ensure that we have power at all times we don't go into a blackout we have a buffer somewhere that will help us members i now put a question that the bill entitled electricity amendment bill 2022 be read for the second time those in favor say the electricity amendment bill 2022 bills committee stage Clause one. I put a question that clause one stands part of the builders. I put a question that clause one stands part of the bill. Those in, in favor say unto the contrary, nay. Guys, how's it? Clause two. I put a question that clause two stands part of the bill. Those in favor say unto the contrary, nay. Guys, how's it? New clause, chair. Uh, right honorable chair uh, the committee is proposing for an insertion of a new clause immediately after clause two as follows amendment of section five of the principal act the principal act is amended in section five by inserting immediately after subsection four the following subsection 4a a member appointed under this section shall have a minimum qualification of a university degree 4b at least one third of the members of the authority shall be women right honorable chairperson the justification for these proposed insertions are one to provide for a clear academic qualification of a member considering the nature of the functions of the authority which require education up to a higher level two in order to cater for affirmative action for women right honorable chair i beg to submit Minister. All right, Honorable Speaker, I accept the committee's proposal. Thank you. I put a question that the, that the, a new clause be inserted immediately before clause three as proposed. Those in favor say unto the contrary, nay. The eyes have it. Clause three. Yeah. Right Honorable Chair, the committee is proposing that uh, Clause 3, which amends Section 7 of the Principal Act, be redrafted to provide as follows. 
by substitution of section seven of the principal act with the following the, uh, as follows a member of the authority shall hold the office for a term of five years and is eligible for reappointment for one more term only. And the second amendment is that the chairperson and two members shall be appointed at the same time, while the other two members shall be appointed one year later. The justification for these amendments are to clearly provide for a staggered term of office. Madam Chair, I beg to submit. Minister. Honorable Minister. Right, Honorable Speaker. Uh, I would request Attorney General, he has got uh, an issue on this proposal, and I request him to submit. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Vice Honorable Speaker. Uh, we agree with the principle of a staggered appointment. However, the way it is drafted now will mean that for one year, you will have only three members. It will contradict the requirement to have five members. So I propose that the clause be redrafted to get the same principle, to say that, to keep the clause as it is, but say provided the members appointed by the authority for the first means for the first term you will appoint the chairperson and two members shall hold office for five years and the others shall hold office for four years and eventually after that it will just become automatic because when one term ends the other one will take off so you read draft it how should it read like? it would read to get to the amendment and read provided the members, it, it will read that a member of the authority shall hold office for a period of five years and is eligible for reappointment. For the first term, shall hold office as follows. The chairperson and two members shall hold office for five years and two members shall hold office for four years. And the rest should remain as Yes, uh, honorable members, I put a question that. Uh... We're, we're looking at reducing the years to three years, Madam Chair, because most standard boards, they have a tenure of three years. Making it five years, it's quite a long time for one person to be on a board. Madam Chair, I suggest that we amend the act to, f to three years instead of five years. Um, right, Honorable Speaker, the, the proposal of five years, these projects that are hand are not short-term projects. If, for example, you're handling a dam, you're going to be building it for a period of seven years. So you do not want to constantly be changing the leadership of the authority. So you must have, I'm, I'm proposing that we keep it at five strictly because of the nature of activities carried out in this sector, which are normally very long-term projects. Honorable members, I put a question on the proposal by Attorney General to amend clause three. Those in favor say unto the contrary nay. Clause three as amended. I now put a question that clause three as amended stands part of the bill. Those in favor say unto the contrary nay. Yes, I have it. Clause four. Chair, close for. Chair, we are, we are proposing to amend clause four by inserting a new paragraph immediately after paragraph A as follows. By deleting paragraph one. Paragraph L. L, L rather, sorry. And B, in paragraph B, in the proposed 
in, in the, the paragraph proposed paragraph QB, we are proposing to insert the word research immediately after the word consultancies. And secondly, we are proposing to delete the proposed paragraph QC. The justification for these amendments in paragraph L, we observe that this has been kept in the bill. Secondly, research should be inserted under paragraph QB because it is one of the crucial roles that should be undertaken by the authority. And finally, the insertion of poor QC seeks to take on some of the powers of the minister who hold the role of overseeing and developing the sector. Madam Chair, I beg to submit. Uh, minister. Madam Chair, I accept the committee's recommendation. Yeah, Madam Chair, clause four seeks to amend uh, the functions of the regulatory body. And I suggest that paragraph D be amended by inclusion of the word that they should validate the electricity meters. The justification for this is very many Ugandans are uncomfortable with the amount of money they are billed. And in many instances, they feel these meters cheat them. So it should be within the duties and the function of the regulatory authority to validate the meters that we are using and it's missing in the function. So we, I suggest that we include it there, the validation of meters to be the function of the regulatory authority. I beg to submit. Uh, by the way, the, the meters are functions of the Uganda, uh, the, the Bureau of Standards. It's not a, a duty of. Madam Chair. The amendment I'm proposing is to put that noble duty under the regulatory authority of no. electricity because it's not being done. As we talk now, none of the Ugandans has seen anybody taking trouble to validate the electricity meters. Don't remove the homes. duty from the Bureau of Standards. It monitors the standards and the quality of what is being brought in. Don't, don't mix up the, 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 the functions. No, Madam Chair, in my wisdom. Members, I, I put a question that clause four be amended Chair. as proposed. Those in favor say unto the contrary, nay. Clause four as amended. I put a question that clause four as amended stands part of the bill. Those in favor say unto the contrary, nay. The eyes have it. New clause. New clause. Chair. Madam Chair, we are proposing to insert a new clause immediately after clause four to read as follows. The principal act is amended by inserting immediately after section 17, the following. 17A, energy policy and energy plan. One, the minister, shall in consultation with the relevant stakeholders develop and publish an energy policy and the energy plan which shall be reviewed every five years. Two, the minister shall prepare and publish a, re a report on the implementation of the energy policy and the energy plan within three months after the end of each financial year. Three, the minister shall, in consultation with the relevant stakeholders, develop, publish, and review energy plan in respect of coal, renewable energy, and electricity. Four, the energy plan shall take into account the national energy policy. B, 
the energy plan shall serve as a guide for energy infrastructure investments. C, the energy plan shall take into account all viable energy supply options. And D, the energy plan shall guide the selection of the appropriate technology to meet energy demands. The justification for these new insertions are to cater for the need for a multi-sectoral team to be involved in planning. I beg to submit. Minister. Chair. 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 Yes. Chair. Uh, yes, I, I beg to make a minor amendment. The use of the word energy includes oil and gas. I would rather for the purpose of this bill, we should retain the word electricity so that is focused on electricity. But if we make it general energy, it would um, include oil and gas. I beg to, to move that amendment. Thank you. Attorney General. Let's first kill you on that. Uh, right on the speaker, I, I get the principle that uh, the honorable member is raising. However, if you keep it as electricity, we leave out others, which we are trying to cover here. Uh, solar, we, we deal with uh, things. So maybe we could, uh, we could define energy here to exclude oil and gas for purposes of this, for purposes of the bill. Definition of the energy will exclude oil and gas. For I, I agree on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Pollard. Thank you, Chair. I, I would like us to be very specific as far as the stakeholders are concerned. Who are these stakeholders? It can happen that the stakeholders can become N in a number. The stakeholder and was not consulted. So we, it is better we be specific and state who the right stakeholders to be consulted by the minister are. Yeah, yes, Chair. Madam Chair, I want to bring the chairperson of budget into context. Maybe before you, you, can, you bring the chairperson of budget, it is saying relevant stakeholders, relevant. The relevant is also relative. I mean, the law is the law. <laughs> uh, yes, and uh, I think the, the purpose of relevant is to allow the person who is sitting there at that time, for circumstances change. The person relevant to nuclear energy may not be necessarily relevant to solar energy. So the persons who are relevant at that time will be addressed. I think it gives us enough room to involve everyone whom we can possibly think about. And, and when you read it further, it tells you that in respect of coal, renewable energy, and then electricity. So it defines the relevant persons, the relevant stakeholders. I put a question that a new clause being started middle after those in favor say unto the control and eh? the eyes have it. Clause five. Clause five. I put a question that clause uh, Madam Chair. part of the bill those in favor say unto the control and eh? the Madam eyes Chair. have it. There was no amendment on clause five. But Madam Chair, I have, a, I have a consideration on that. I have a, an issue with that. Because yes, if we... You can go and commit on committee. Clause 6. I put a question that clause 6 stands part of the bill. Those in favor say unto the contrary nay. The eyes have reached. Clause 7. I put a question that clause 7 stands part of the bill. Those in favor say aye and to the contrary nay. The eyes have reached. Clause 8. Chair. Madam Chair, Clause 8 seeks to amend Section 44 of the Principal Act 
by substituting the words 21 days with the 28 days. The justification for this, Madam Chair and Honorable Colleagues, is to maintain consistency with the section 434. Honorable Angora, do we have another chair behind? Come and sit here. Madam Chair, thank you. Here, uh -uh. Madam, and replace the PM. Madam Chair, thank you for yes. promoting my brother to the front bench. So I was just saying that uh, that uh, uh, clause eight seeks to amend section 44 of the Principal Act by substituting 21 days with the 28 days. And the justification for this amendment is to maintain consistency with section 434 of the Principal Act, which provides for the appeal to the tribunal to be made within 28 days after receipt of the notice. Madam Chair, I beg to submit. Chair, uh, Minister. Madam Chair, the committee was observant, I concede. I put a question that clause 8 be amended as proposed. Those in favor say to the contrary, nay. Yes, of it. Clause 8 as amended. I put a question that clause 8 as amended stands part of the bill. Those in favor say to the contrary, nay. Yes, of it. Clause 9. Clause 9. I put a question that clause 9 stands part of the bill. Those in favor say to the contrary, nay. Yes, of it. Clause 10. I put a question that clause 10 stands part of the bill. Those in favor say to the contrary, nay. Yes, of it. Clause 11. Chair. Madam Chairperson, clause 11 seeks to substitute section 51 of the Principal Act. And we are proposing to substitute the words by notice in the Gazette with the words by regulations. The justification for this amendment is that the capacity of limiting megawatts should be determined by the authority through regulations. Madam Chairperson, I beg to submit. Minister. Madam Chair, I concede. I put a question that clause 11 be amended as proposed. Those in favor say unto the contrary, nay. Yes, of it. Clause 11 as amended. I put a question that clause 11 as amended stands part of the bill. Those in favor say unto the contrary, nay. Yes, of it. Clause 12. I put a question that clause 12 stands part of the bill. Those in favor say unto the contrary, nay. Yes, of it. Clause 13. I put a question that clause 13 stands part of the bill. Those in favor say unto the contrary, nay. Madam Chair, in clause 14, we on one. And therefore, we are first of all proposing that the head note should read amendment of section 56 of the principal act instead of substitution of section 56 of the principal act. And so we are proposing uh, to delete subsection L, yeah, is one rather. Subsection one, and also in B, we are proposing uh, to substitute the word circumstances with the word terms in subsection three. Oh, yes. In the proposed, uh, the amendment we are making is that in the proposed subsection three, we are proposing two amendments. One, by substituting the word circumstances 
with the words terms. And secondly, we are proposing by substituting the words or a holder of a distribution license with the words a licensee. C, by inserting immediately after the proposed subsection three, the following. The terms prescribed in the regulations under subsection three shall not provide for undue preference to a specific class or category of customer. Yeah, is that subsection one in the principal act is sufficient and it captures and is better captured. Secondly, the amendment in subsection three will eliminate the monopoly of a bulk supplier. And finally, the insertion is for purposes of fairness, whereby we are proposing, uh, yeah, that is all. Madam Chair, I beg to submit. Yes, uh, thank you. Madam Chair, I'm finding uh, use of the word in a close spell of which we passed, we said the minister Close shall, what? the one we were already passed, we said the minister shall, by regulation, prescribe. Then when we come down here, we are now saying, clause 14, where we are, we are saying the authority may, by regulations. So we are having a contradiction. In one clause, the minister to do regulation. In another clause, the authority. I think we need to have uniformity where the minister is the one that does all the regulations in the act. And I've seen that contradiction as we go forward. Right Honorable Speaker and the member, yes, the contradictions that seem like contradiction in this are actually, are actually intentional. There are certain regulations which have been prescribed for the minister, but the more technical ones have been left to the authority. So to get all of them, because the minister may not have some of the technical capacity for which you want to regulate. So where you find the authority has been given that function, the authority is dealing with, and then the minister is dealing with policy regulation. So we, it, it is, you can address point by point, but not a common thread. Madam Chair, uh, Madam Chair I wanted to advise the AG, because you, down you there... Know, AG, what is... What what AG is saying, there are some regulations that should be made by the minister and others by the authority, electricity regulatory authority, that you can't give all the powers to one person. Chair, there uh, will be an abuse. Chair, uh, I think uh, we have to. I think the minister is right here, in the sense that all activities related to performance day-to-day uh, -day performance or whatever is related to technicality that one should be left to the authority because the minister may not have the technical know-how and can That's right. you know so i think i have understood it's just purely a matter of management here really. right. yes uh... yeah thank you very much chair i also seek the input of the land attorney general on this issue of bulking. Here in the law, bulking is looked at only from one side, that is the side of the providers of, of electricity energy. Yet in practice, bulking Why is, is bulking also, in this clause. In the definition, and that's what we are seeking to amend. We are amending oh, bulking. Let's, look at, are, let's look at one thing at a go. Uh, Honorable members, I put a question that clause 14 be amended as proposed. Those in favor, say to the contrary, nay. Let's have it. Clause 14 as amended. I put, I put a question that clause 14 as amended stands part of the bill. Those in favor, say to the contrary, nay. Let's have it. A chair, insertion. 
Right Honorable Chair, we are proposing an insertion immediately after clause 14 to read as follows. Amendment of section 64 of the Principal Act. Section 64 in the head note by substituting for the words rural electrification fund, the words electricity development fund. B, in section, in subsection one, by substituting for the words rural electrification fund, the words electricity development fund. C, in subsection two, by deleting paragraph C. D, in subsection 3D, by substituting for the words rural electrification, the words E, by inserting immediately after subsection 3, a new subsection as follows. The minister shall lay before parliament approved annual estimates of revenue and expenditure drawn from the fund in accordance with section 13 of the Public Finance Management Act. Madam Chairperson, the justification for these insertions are, one, rural electrification program has been mainstream into the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development. Two, the committee observed that the rural electrification levy intended for rural electrification is currently deposited in the consolidated fund as part of the national budget. The levy currently charged at 5% of the transmission bulk purchases of electricity from generation stations, therefore, need not be charged to the end user consumer. Three, the laying of approval annual and accountability. Madam Chair, I beg to submit. Honorable Minister. Madam Chair, I concede. Thank you. I put a question that a new clause being started merely left at Clause 14 has proposed those in favor sent to the control in May. The eyes have it. Clause 15. Clause 15, Chair. Madam Chair, Clause 15 seeks to amend Section 75 of the Principal Act by inserting immediately after paragraph B the following. C. By inserting immediately after subsection 10, the following subsections. 11, an application for a distribution license shall include a net metering plan for all customer categories. 12, the application shall be granted after satisfying the requirements of metering as provided for in the regulations. The justification for these amendments is that the committee contends that net metering is a standard practice in electricity markets globally. Each distribution licensee should, upon application, make available net metering services to any electricity consumer or captive power generator that the licensee serves. Madam Chair, I beg to submit. Uh, Minister. Madam Chair, I accept the recommendation of the committee. I put a question that clause 15 be amended as proposed. Those in favor say unto the contrary may. Right, have it. Clause 15 as amended. I put a question that clause 15 as amended stands part of the bill. Those in favor say unto the contrary may. Yes, have it. Clause 16. Clause 16, I put a question that clause 16 stands part of the bill. Those in favor say unto the contrary, eh? Clause 
Guys, I'll reach. Close 18. Chair. Madam Chair, close 18. Close 18.6 to provide for an insertion of a new subsection 83A and the 83B. A, in the proposed section 83A subsection 2, by inserting the words under this act immediately after the words relevant section. B, in the proposed section 83B, by inserting after the proposed subsection 4, the following new subsections. For the penalty imposed under this section for purposes of tariff calculation shall not form part of the licensee's allowable regulated costs. Five, a licensee aggrieved by the decision of the authority shall appeal to the Electricity Disputes Tribunal Proposed section 83A, subsection 2, uh, the insertion is meant, the amendment is meant to avoid ambiguity. And secondly, for the penalty to be effective, it should not form part of the allowable regulated cost for the licensee for purposes of tariff calculation. Madam Chair, I beg to submit. Madam um, Chair, I accept the committee's proposal. I put a question that clause 18 be amended as proposed, does in favor say under the control. 18 as amended. I put a question that clause 18 as amended stands part of the bill, does in favor say under the control. Eh? The eyes have. Madam Chair, after clause 18, we are proposing an insertion of a new clause immediately after of section 85 of the Principal Act. The Principal Act is amended in section 85 by substituting for the words five a term not exceeding one year or both the words 20,000 currency points or imprisonment not exceeding 10 years or both. Madam Chair, the justification for this is for consistency with the new insertions in the bill where penalties have been reviewed to match the current situation. Madam Chair, I beg to submit. Minister. Madam Chair. I concede. I put a question that a new clause be inserted immediately. Yes. I, I uh, thank you, Chair. I, I did uh, uh, request earlier. I don't know whether the Attorney General, to assure the House that uh, we are not legislating a, a conflict of laws. Given the ongoing revision of uh, the not ever to assure us that we are safe. Uh, thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Uh, right Honorable Speaker, I did say here before the laws to regulate penalties are set by this parliament. This parliament never gave away the right to set any other penalty. So if the law had set a lower penalty and this house feels that for this particular aspect, I need to set a higher penalty, it would. It guides everyone else to be bound by that, but not the parliament. So there will be no conflict. Parliament is still seized with the authority to set the parameters. <laughs> I put a question that a new, a new clause be inserted immediately after clause 18 as proposed. Those in favor say unto the contrary, nay. Yes, I have it. <laughs> Clause 19. Chair. Madam Chair, 
clause 19.6 to amend section 85 of the principal act. A, in the head note by section 85 of the principal act, the words insertion of a new section 85A. B, by substituting for the words, the principal act is amended by substituting for section 85 the following, the words, the principal act is amended by inserting immediately after section 85 the following. C, in the head note of the proposed section 85, by substituting for the figure 85, the figure 85A. The justification, Madam Chair, is for consistency with the new insertions in the bill where penalties have been reviewed to match the current situations. Madam Chair, I beg to submit. Chair, I mean, Minister. Madam Chair, um, I accept the committee's proposal and substituting the words of the penalty in section 85 with the following. Commits an offense and is liable on conviction to a fine not exceeding 50,000 currency points or imprisonment not exceeding 15 years or both. And my justification for that redrafting is the penalty should be brought in tandem with the uh, proposed penalties of the bill to reflect the severity of the vice. Eji, can you redraft for us this, this yeah. amendment? The, the redraft is to read that uh, the, the amendment was interference with the meters and works in public lamps. And at the end of section 85A now, is just to add the words commits an offense and is liable on conviction to a fine not exceeding 50,000 currency points or imprisonment not exceeding 15 years or both. Does it complement to the committee's? Yes, it's just adding to the committee's proposal. At the end of the committee's proposal, just add the penalty. Okay. Madam Chair, I agree to the proposal of uh, my minister and of the learned attorney general, because most colleagues here articulated the issue of uh, uh, vandalism as a big problem and the need to have deterrent penalties. So the proposal is actually increasing from 10 years imprisonment to 15 years imprisonment. So I agree to that amendment. Uh, I put a question that clause 19 be amended as proposed by the committee and the attorney general doesn't favor Insertion by, yes. Madam Chair, I concur with the years, but it's not balancing with the fine. The currency points is so low and it says either or. Oh, both. Is how much? 50,000 is one billion. 50,000 currency points. One billion. Okay, maybe, but uh, it again looks uh, beyond normal, which is impossible. Yeah. So we shall be tagging what you know you can never charge. Uh, you see, when, when we put a charge, the, the, the one paying must have. But if most of these vandalizers are like cattle rustlers. They don't, they are not. Okay, okay. Honorable Chair, I would, want to, I would want to believe that a penalty should be deterrent, but most importantly, 
it should enable government to recover the loss it has incurred upon some of these activities. So it should be something realistic that one can actually pay. Why levy a billion on a loss of about 50 million, yet you can charge somebody 60 million? So we need to be careful while handling that. Chair. Yeah. Madam Chair, most colleagues have submitted on this, but I just want to give an example how grave the issue of vandalism is. When one tower, just one tower, is cut down by vandals, the cost of one tower is about 315 million Ugandan shillings. Now, when one tower is cut down, it affects the one on the other side and the one on this side. So for us to propose a penalty of one billion, we are just perfectly in order. Madam Chair, yeah. I beg to submit. Yeah. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh... The minister and the committee, if you put one billion, it will make people to bribe police and then the justice system. It is better, we say, the, to recover the value twice. For example, if a transformer is 300 million, then let the culprit pay 600 million. Otherwise, we'll not be able to convict any person because people will bribe their way. No. Uh, but they are saying the 50 currency points. That is 1 billion shillings. It's 1 billion. Yes, Madam Chair. 1 billion, if somebody has committed a crime, worth 50 million shillings and is told to pay 1 billion. No, we are putting a deterrent measure so that you don't do it next time again. Maybe to clarify to members, when you're setting up penal factors like this, anyone trying to vandalize to vandalize electricity or energy infrastructure should know that their likely ending up is in prison. If you give them 50,000, they are capable of paying you. So for us, we are telling you, you steal them, you are not likely to get a billion, you will get 15 years. So it's deterrent. So it's telling you what is my option. It's like telling them the only option you have is to go to prison. So the question is, do I really want to vandalize? It, it works. But honorable members, the people who are carrying out these activities are extremely sophisticated people. It is not sustainable to, uh, to believe that a person will take down a tower line and is just simply an ordinary person walking the streets. These people are sophisticated, so we need to deter them from making this a business. Honorable Madam members, Chair. I put a question that clause 19 be amended as proposed by the committee and further amendment by the Attorney General with additional insertion on penalties. Those in favor say unto the contrary. I have it. Clause 19 as amended. Honorable members, this is not a market. And those ones who are saying, you know, those are the ones who vandalize these places. Clause 19 as amended. I put a question that clause 19 as amended stands part of the bill. Those in favor stand to the contrary. Eh? Let's have it. New clause. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, for that guidance. Uh, clause 20, we are seeking to insert a new clause. New clause. Immediate. Clause 19. Okay. Insertion after of a 19, new clause. 19, you have a new clause. We are proposing to insert immediately after clause 19 a new clause as follows. Amendment of Section 86 of the Principal Act. The Principal Act is amended in Section 86 by substituting for the words 30 currency points or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding three years or both the words 20,000 currency points or imprisonment not exceeding 10 years or both. 
the justification is this is a consequential amendment following the one we've just made. Madam Chair, I beg uh, to submit. Minister. Madam Chair, I accept the committee's proposal. I put a question that a new clause be inserted immediately after clause 19 as proposed does in favor of saying to a contrary name. I submit. Clause 20. Clause 20, Chair. Madam Chairperson, clause 26 to substitute section 86 of the principal clause act. 20. Clause 20 is substitution of section 86 of the principal act. Clause 20 is amended A in the head note by substituting for the words substitution of section 86 of the principal act, the words insertion of a new section 86A. B, by substituting for the words, the principal act is amended by substituting for section 86 the following. The, the, the following, the following. The principal act is amended by inserting immediately after section 86 the following. C, in the head note of the proposed section 85, by substituting for the figure 86, the figure 86A. Justification is section 86 has been maintained in the principal act, and so the new provision should appear as an insertion into the bill and not as a substitution. Madam Chair, I beg to submit. Honorable Minister. Madam Chair, I accept the committee's proposal to insert section 86A as maintained in the bill. Madam Chair, this section seeks to punish even a person who accidentally, maybe by way of driving, knocks down an electric pole. So to subject this person to the punishments we've just been discussing here, it is unrealistic. So this it should not be an import of the other punishment to hear because it reads a person who willfully or negligently causes energy to be diverted from its proper course or be wasted or breaks, throws down or causes to fall or damages any supply line, post, pole or any other equipment. I've seen many people driving and they knock these electricity poles accidentally. So we can't subject the kind of punishment we've been discussing to Section 86. It should not be deterrent. It should be a recoverable punishment to recover the loss in on government, you, you, but not a deterrent you, punishment. The, are you supposed to drive around the, the poles? Madam Speaker, mine is not to, to levy a punishment of one billion on a person who has accidentally knocked down an electric Where pole. It could be even a mechanical damage. Let the punishment be recoverable, but not deterrent. So let the person pay the, no, the, the damage. The, Madam if Chair. it's an accident, that one will be determined at that time. Ma, is, ma, Madam Chair, and this, this clause speaks to willful. Willfully is different from an, uh, from an accident, which you are alluding to. So the, the spirit of the law is different from what you are speaking to. I beg to. It talks of willfully or negligently. So if somebody didn't service his vehicle, if somebody Doctor, didn't service his vehicle, it could Doctor, amount to negligently. Doctor, what is the meaning but of some negligent. very unfortunate. What is the meaning of negligently? Madam Speaker, in Uganda, due to circumstances, especially in on us by government, sometimes we find ourselves very negligent, yet we should. But overall, the punishment here should not be deterrent. The punishment should enable government to recover the loss in doctor, card. Doctor, you know, I don't want you to blame Dr. Batwa. Dr. Batwa is a great doctor. Yeah, let's help the doctor on this matter. I don't mean Dr. Bed. I think there are two things here. 
Number one, for this file to be given to you, there is a due process. You must go through a due process. Yes. You you will go to court, make your case. Number two, an accident is a defense. If you really prove to court that the destruction was occasioned by an accident, court will listen to you. So I I, I think let's not create an impression that you somebody will wake up and say pay the billion or go to jail. No, there is a due process. I think that's what we need to to, to understand when we are talking about penal provisions. Penal provisions don't exist in the abstract. There is a due process of the law. Will be able to prove their case before a court of law. There is a defense of an accident. Haji, 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 Katuntu. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. To be held criminally liable, you have taken two things into consideration. One, what we call mens rea. You must have a criminal intention and you put into action that criminal intention, what we, we, we call an act race. So, the prosecution has a duty to prove that actually you had that criminal intention and you put that criminal intention into effect by doing a particular criminal act. Those are the only two grounds upon which you can be found criminally liable. If you go through that, I don't see any reason why the doctor is worried. There is a process. and and and. Right on our chairperson, the proof in any criminal matter, what we call the burden is on the prosecution, the one alleging. But it also has a standard, and the standard is beyond reasonable doubt. So all the safeguards are there within the law, and really, doctor, your, your concerns really are misplaced. They're just let us have busy uh, actually uh, I don't, uh, okay I, I don't i don't have a, a, a mild english word to use but let us punch these people who really thank you i put a question that clause 20 be amended as proposed those in favor say unto the contrary may yes of it clause 20 as amended i put a question that clause 20 as amended stands part of the bill those in favor say unto the contrary may Yes, have it. Clause 21. I put a question that clause 21 stands part of the bill. Those in favor say unto the contrary, may. Yes, have it. Clause 22. I put a question that clause 22 stands part of the bill. Those in favor say unto the contrary, may. Yes, have it. Clause 23. I put a question that clause 23 stands part of the bill. Those in favor say unto the contrary, may. Yes, have it. Clause 24. I put a question that clause 24 stands part of the bill. Those in favor say unto the contrary, may. The eyes have it. Panadol, you're just there quiet. Clause 25. <laughs> Chair. Madam Chair, I'm dropping this proposed uh, uh, amendment. I have realized that. Uh, since the authority consists of five members, if we created uh, two uh, committee, subcommittees, then one would have three and the other one would have two. So I'm withdrawing that proposed amendment. So, uh, I put a question that close and five cents part of the bill doesn't favor say to the control name. Yes, have it. Clause 26. I put a question that clause 26 stands part of the bill. Those in favor say unto the contrary, may. Yes, have it. Clause 27. I put a question that clause 27 stands part of the bill. Those in favor say unto the contrary, may. Yes, have it. Clause 28. Chair. 
Madam Chair, we are proposing to amend clause 28 in subsection 3 by inserting immediately after the words in consultation with the Public Service Commission, the words appointed by the tribunal. The justification is for proper procedure of appointment of staff of the registry of the tribunal. Madam Chair, I beg to submit. Minister. Madam Chair, the committee was vigilant. I, I accept their proposal. <laughs> I put a question that clause 28 be amended as proposed. That's in favor of saying to the contrary. Clause 28 as amended. I put a question that clause 28 as amended stands part of the bill. That's in favor of saying to the contrary. Right, has it. Clause 29. I put a question that clause 29 stands part of the bill, doesn't ever say unto the contrary, may. Aye. Yes, has it. Clause 30. I put a question that clause 30 stands part of the bill, doesn't ever say unto the contrary, may. Aye. Yes, has it. Clause 31. Chair. Yeah. Madam Chair, we are proposing to amend clause 31 in the proposed section 119A in subsection 1 by inserting a new paragraph immediately after paragraph. In subsection 1 by F as follows net metering. B by inserting a new subsection immediately after subsection two, the following. Three, regulations made under this section shall be laid before parliament for information. Justification, the insertion of a provision on net metering in clause 15 of the bill warrants empowering the authority to make regulations for the same. Secondly, there is need for the authority to lay regulations before Parliament for information to enhance accountability and transparency. Madam Chair, I beg to submit. Minister. Madam Chair, I concede. However, we, we are here laying of regulations on the floor of parliament is a responsibility of a minister. The authority doesn't come to parliament. So I propose, we actually, instead of the authority, we say the minister. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Attorney General. All right, Honorable Speaker, that's correct. It's the minister who would uh, bring the regulations to Parliament. I put a question that a clause that one be amended as proposed by the minister, Honorable Okasai. Those in favor say unto the contrary, no? Yes, have it. Clause 31 as amended. I put a question that clause 31 as amended stands part of the bill. Those in favor say unto the contrary, no? Yes, have it. Clause 32. I put a question that clause 32 stands part of the bill. Those in favor say unto the contrary, no? Yes, have it. Clause 33. I put a question that clause 33 stands part of the bill. Those in favor say unto the contrary, no? Yes, have it. Question had already been put, you can commit. Yeah, pardon? Question had already been put. No, I was ready up, uh, Madam Chair. I beg your indulgence. I, I needed to, before the question was put, to to get the uh, the clarification of the dear person because our earlier discussion. The chairperson is not attentive. Uh, 
Honorable Chair, the, the import of uh, Clause 33 seeks to introduce a new section in the Principal Act to enable these companies of UEB. I am looking at the report and uh, I did not see the chairperson rise. Yeah, this was part of the discussion where the chairperson and the committee considered to the effect of clause 33 that sought to empower the minister to float shares in the women successor companies. Uh, chairperson line uh, and uh, we are aware that these successor companies are profit public profit making companies and uh, and allow them to become partly owned by private individuals again it will be a fleecing of the public using the law. Right on speak uh, chair, public utilities like power are meant to provide services to the population. And here we are inviting private interest. Hitherto, we are discussing the problem of tariffs to domestic consumers. And the, the committee moved to, to ameliorate this by reducing VAT from 18 to 10%. If we leave out, we leave close to the three intact, it will be a very serious application of public duty and it will be an invitation for speculators into these profit making public companies to buy any shares. Uh, Honorable Chair, I would like to invite the House to consider 33 as a child a problem. And uh, the chairperson of the committee needs to explain to this house where it lives comfort in making no comment on clause 33. Uh, 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 Lord, what is your proposal to delete? To delete completely 33. Because uh, the question that was being put that it remains part of the bill and is problematic, Chair. Uh, Attorney General. I think, uh, 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 right, Honorable Speaker, I think the, the law has a, a point because in the report it was addressed, but I think the committee, when it was making its presentation, did not raise it. We actually thought he had dropped it. That's why we did not raise it. And I think the committee chair can advise us on where they are with that. If it's our way. Yes that uh, in our recommendation actually we made it clear that uh, the committee recommended that clause that three be deleted unfortunately when we were extracting the amendments we forgot to extract this for deletion so my apologies madam chair so and i want to i want to applaud my brother the law for pointing it uh, out. Uh, uh, Dr. Batua, can you leave my law? Get back to where you're sitting. <laughs> Lob, I want to applaud you for recognizing that we had actually made this omission, but also for having worked very, very closely with the committee right from uh, the time we were examining this. Honorable thank members, you. thank you for being observative. And uh, I put a question. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I accept that section to be deleted, that clause. Love, thank you for the observation. By love to delete clause 33. Those in favor say to respond to the name. Yes, has it. Daito. I put a question that title, the title stands part of the bill. Those in favor say to the contrary name. Yes, have it. 
motion for resumption of the house. Honorable Minister. I beg that uh, the house resumes. Resumes to discuss, uh, to debate the report of the committee, of the committee, of the whole house. I beg to move that the house be resumes and the committee of the whole house reports there too. Honorable members, I put a question that the House do resume and the committee of the whole House reports there too. Those in favor say unto the contrary, nay. The eyes have it. Clark. Report of the committee of the whole house. Honorable Minister. Right, Honorable Speaker, I beg to report that the house considered the bill entitled Electricity Amendment Bill 2022 and passed it with amendments. Motion for adoption of the report of the Committee of the Whole House. Honorable members, I put a question that the report of the Committee of the Whole House be adopted. Those in favor say unto the contrary the nay. Aye. The eyes have it. Bill start reading the electricity amendment bill 2022. Honorable Minister. I beg to move the bill entitled electricity bill, electricity amendment bill 2022 be read for the third time and, and, and be passed. I submit. <laughs> Honorable members, I now put a question that the bill entitled the Electricity Amendment Bill 2022 be read the third time and do pass. Those in the favor say unto the contrary, nay. The eyes have it. A bill for an act titled the Electricity Amendment Act. <laughs> A bill for an act titled the Electricity Amendment Act 2022. The bill. No, you have a right. Honorable members, the bill has been passed.
right honorable unsettled right honorable madam speaker and honorable colleagues i would like to convey my very sincere appreciation to you right honorable speaker first and foremost for being there always with us and for providing the environment for us to pass this bill today i recall very well that last night you were there with me up to very late and you personally was, in I your office not, i was not with you right right honorable speaker right honorable speaker right honorable speaker i must say there is a clarification from kivalia right honorable speaker uh, uh, there is a clarification from busoga there is a clarification thank you madam speaker thank you madam speaker madam speaker i'm seeking clarification from the chair as a musoga as a as a member i'm seeking clarification from the chair madam speaker because we are normally informed that the time but the chair has informed us that due to the requirement and the need for the bill he decided to be with you up to late in the night so i'm seeking clarification from the chair to clarify those hours and it actually is equally provided for in the law. Honorable member, we are late. We left office late, trying to process the bill. And, uh, and uh, there shouldn't be any concern. That's my son. That is my son. And uh, Busoga is concerned. <laughs> right, Honorable Speaker, thank you very much for the clarification. You know, I just want to let Honorable Members know that members of Parliament are actually employed to work 24 hours. So it's not true that the committees can only work during daytime. But that was for humor and to express how much input the right honorable, honorable members invested. Uh, anyway, Chair, you can see it, honorable members. I want to thank you so much for, for passing this very important bill. And this bill is going to help us so much with the vandalizers. With the, don't, with the people who don't appreciate government property. I really want to appreciate this house for staying up to this long and passing. I want to thank the, the minister. I want to thank the minister of energy. Uh, you've done a good job. We must appreciate. I also want, I also want to thank the ministers who have stayed around. Uh, Honorable Justin Lumumba, Honorable uh, Henry and uh, educa education, but most importantly, thank the Attorney General for the legal guidance that he has given. Attorney General on this side and on the other side. And then I want to thank the chairperson of the committee, the vice plus the whole committee. And special thanks, special thanks go to my lead of opposition lead of opposition you've done a great job and my shadow attorney general honorable cartoon too and then my shadow speaker the shadow speaker <laughs> and <laughs> i want to thank honorable members i want to thank all of you for passing this bill 
It is a very, very important bill for our country. And the old woman for staying here longer, thank you for staying here longer. The Miss Uganda, thank you so much. I want to really appreciate what you people have done. It's a very good milestone for the country. I therefore adjourn the house to two tomorrow.